Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Tuesday, October 23rd, 2018 meeting of the Longmeadow School Committee. I now call the meeting to order. This meeting is being recorded and aired live by LCTV, as well as being live streamed on longmeadow.org. It is a legal requirement for anyone else to disclose if they are recording this meeting. Please stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America our temporary clerk will be Karen if you'd like to update us on correspondence um, no correspondence was received and I guess we'll move to the minutes. Yeah, we'll move to the approval of the minutes. So I'm, I move that the school committee approve the minutes to the October 1st, 2018 school committee meeting as presented. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, we, can, we do have a quorum, so we can call for a vote. All those in favor? Any opposed or abstaining? So motion passes. And that is the only recommended motion in terms of minutes. Visitors' comments this evening? We don't have any visitors. Any school committee announcements or recognitions at this time? Nope, seeing none, we can move right into our business with guests this evening. And tonight we are very fortunate to have our delegation from Japan from our sister school in Takikawa um, they are here tonight, so I'm going to invite our teacher, Lori Snyder, as well as Kamora Sensei and his students, Yuna and Atoha, to join us at the table. Any, any four. Any four is fine. Yeah. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us at our meeting here tonight. I think that Lori will give us a little bit, give the committee a little bit of a background. Yeah, sure. Um, so I am Lori Snyder and I'm a history teacher here at Longmeadow High School. And I coordinate the Longmeadow Takikawa Exchange Program and we are currently in our 13th year of our exchange. Um, and why do we have an exchange program with Takikawa? Well, a lot of it has to do with the fact that Massachusetts and Hokkaido, which is the northernmost island in Japan, have a, a sister state relationship. That relationship was formalized in the early 1990s. Uh, and, um, but actually our, our connection in Western Mass to Hokkaido goes all the way back to the late 19th century when Dr. William Clark, who was then president of uh, Massachusetts Agricultural College, which was the previous name for um, UMass, went to Hokkaido and actually founded their prefectural university, uh, Hokkaido University. He's very well known um, throughout Hokkaido and actually throughout all of Japan. Um, when he left, there's a very famous painting and a very famous moment where he collected all of these young college students, um, and they were male. It was the late 19th century. But he basically said to them, boys be ambitious. And that is a slogan that um, all Japanese know. So when I'm in Japan and I'm traveling, it doesn't matter if I'm on the main island, down south in Hiroshima. If I say I have a sister school in Hokkaido, the first thing Japanese will say to me is boys be ambitious. But we update that now, right? All of our students must be ambitious. Um, anyhow, we've had a friendship relationship. We actually have an official friendship document that is signed between the town of Longmeadow and the city government in Takikawa. Takikawa is a, a city, it's much larger than Longmeadow, it's about 41,000 people. And, um, and then we also have a sister school relationship that is official with Takikawa West High School. And so um, right now we have um, Shigeo Kimura-sensei, who's an English teacher. Uh, in Japan, the foreign language is mandated and it has to be English. So he is the equivalent of a foreign language teacher and I call him the Japanese teacher of English or JTE. And he has two of his students uh, with him who are, uh, again, they take English and study English and um, they are here with us for two weeks. 
And so we have, we have actually hosted uh, two students and a teacher from Takikawa West High School for the past 12 years. And during the two weeks, the students stay with their LHS host siblings during the day. All day long, they just shadow them, except for during my Asian Studies class. They actually are active participants in my Asian Studies class. Kimura Sensei, on the other hand, he visits in the morning all six buildings in the district over those 10 days and spends his afternoons at the high school uh, participating in class, observing classes. He does all sorts of things. We assign him um, a schedule, and so he will spend time with support staff. He spends time with the librarian or media center specialist. He goes to the guidance counselor. He'll see Kate Mard in her the life skills program. Uh, we really want to show as showcase as much as we can what we do here and what our school looks like, so that he can then bring that information back to Takikawa West High School. And personal, on a personal level, Kimura Sensei and I get to teach together. Yes. And um, actually, this is his second time to Long Meadow. He came in 2012, and but he was in the old building, so he was very excited to have an opportunity to come back a second time and see the new um, LHS. And just one more thing quickly, we actually have two programs. So next week on Halloween, on Wednesday. Um, the junior ambassadors from Takikawa will arrive, and it's a group of seven, six female students, one male student, a government official, and um, a group leader who happens to be a retiring teacher this year. They come for a very short period of time. So they're arriving Wednesday. They've all been matched with host families, and um, they um, spend all day Friday at our school. And Saturday's a free day with their host family. And then Sunday morning, they're gone by 8.30 in the morning. And they go off to Boston and spend a few days sightseeing in Boston. And um, I just wanted to say, on Friday night, just to kind of give it a little plug, uh, we have a Japan night. It's a uh, Japan cultural night. It's a fundraiser to support our program so that it's now self-sustaining. And um, we have uh, traditional Japanese drumming going on. We have a uh, traditional koto performance. The uh, Sensei Jim Shea, who uh, teaches karate here through uh, in town through LPRD, the black belts are coming and give a performance. The um, junior ambassadors and the Takikawa West students will give presentations about their city in case you want to know more about Takikawa. And then they perform a traditional fishing folk dance, the Yosakoi dance, which is uh, they have practiced for months and months and months. And um, then after that formal program, we move into the cafeteria. And this year, we'll have 12 different interactive cultural stations, all highlighting different Japanese traditional cultural events. And those stations are co-run by our friends from Japan, as well as members of my East Asia Club. So that's taking place Friday evening at LHS at 6 PM, 6 to 9. It's $5 for students with ID, $10 for adults, and it's a great bargain, $20 for families of three or more. So we're trying to get the word out. We'd love to see more people come out. And just so you know, our program has really resonated with people who have connections to Japan and Western Mass. And we've even caught the attention of the consul in Boston. So the uh, Mr. Yamauchi, who is the cultural affairs consul from the Japan consulate in Boston, will be coming out to um, he'll give remarks at our culture night and to participate in our culture night. We are also bringing in people from the Japan Society in Hartford who are now coming up north to see what we do here at Long Meadow. So enough about that. I'm going to turn it over to um, Kimura Sensei. And um, is it OK if he just gives his uh, introduction? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, a little introduction. Uh, good evening. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you all. Uh, today, uh, I'd like to say thank you for inviting us and giving a chance to talk with you. Uh, let me introduce myself. Okay. My name is Shigeo Kimura. Uh, I'm from Takikawa City in Japan. Uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm a high school English teacher. Uh, I came to Long Meadow to chaperone these two students who joined the exchange program between Takikawa Nishi High School and Long Meadow High School. This exchange program started over 10 years ago. Uh, Takikawa Nishi High School and Long Meadow High School has been sister schools. Uh, and they have had a good relationship for years. I'd like to appreciate the 
great help uh, people in Long Meadow provides. Uh, without it, we can't continue this program successfully. Uh, I hope this relationship will develop more in the future. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> <coughs> Hello. I'm Yuna Saito. Uh, I came from Takikura City in Japan. Nice to meet you. Hi, I'm Motaha Konish. I came from Takikawa City in Japan. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thank you for coming. I think if um, the committee has any questions um, you'd like to ask or of, of how our delegation is enjoying their visit so far, feel free to open it up. You can. I'll jump in if no one else <laughs> I guess my first question would be, um, because um, Ms. Snyder had mentioned that you haven't been in our new high school, my, my first question would be, what is your impression of our new building and are you enjoying it? Uh, I enjoy new building uh, very much. Uh, I was very impressed the facilities. Uh, 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 there are many new techno technologies in, in every classroom. Uh, there is no... Uh, in Japanese high school, there, uh, there are a few, uh, there are a few uh, projectors in classrooms, and uh, there is no uh, electric um, blackboard. <laughs> so, uh, and the method to teach uh, teach subject is also uh, great. Uh, teacher, all teachers use uh, discussion uh, or uh, gr group. Uh, a group talk. Uh, uh, this this is not uh, usual in Japanese high school, so I, I was impressed very much. I, is my English correct? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's <Great>. impressive. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Bronwyn? Um, thank you so much for coming. I was just wondering um, if the students uh, could maybe share with us what the biggest difference is between their school at home and Long Meadow High. Should students say, say, yes. say mm -hmm. comment about this? Yes. Ah, uh, ah, uh, 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 they, they are thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll translate it. Japanese is okay. You can translate it. Uh, uh, she, she thinks uh, in Japan, uh, many students uh, don't don't tell their opinion in class. Uh, but in American student uh, actively uh, tell, tell their, say their opinion to teachers. Uh, this this is a big difference uh, between uh, Japanese school and uh, schools in the U.S. Thank you. Does anyone else have a hand? Oh, another. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Ah, uh, she she said the fa uh, facility is uh, very new. Uh, uh, to to be honest, my school is very old, <laughs> and in the whole uh, in the hallway is uh, when it is called. Uh, 
ゼアラサ,サムス,スノーゼアラ,ゼアラサ,サムスノーゲ,ゲートインザホールウェイ<laughs> yeah, just to put it in perspective,、uh, so Takikawa West High School, it's actually quite beautiful, but inside it's very traditional. So it looks like, the, like a lot like the old LHS before whiteboards, even. So there's chalkboards and chalk. The desks are all wood. There's like 40 to 45 desks in a classroom、um, in Japan, and they don't have central heating. And so what you find is like a heater with a pot of water on top of it where steam comes out, and that's how they heat the school. But in the,、um, In the hallway, the hallways aren't heated, so that it can be really cold in the hallway, and then you walk in the classroom and it's actually really hot、um, inside. But it's, it's definitely, like I would say, you know, no frills、um, education.、Um. Uh, sorry, my explanation is not enough. <laughs> yeah, it was good. It was perfect. <laughs> no, no, it was great. Yeah.、Uh, Kamara Sensei, welcome. Yuna Utaha, welcome. We're so happy to have you here. And, and, and I want to、um, thank and acknowledge、uh, Laura Snyder for her work over the you know, more than a decade of building this partnership with Takakawa. And、um, she had a vision、uh, long ago for this partnership and, and has realized it through、uh, her ability to kind of reach out to some key people at, in, the, in the community.、Um, and you know, Tom Lander, Larry Birdie, Tom Landers.、Um, Paul Dunkley has,、uh, is, is fully involved in the exchange, and Eric Howard and so many others、uh, pitch in, and, and actually now it's extended to the other schools. So, you know, to, to thank and acknowledge Lori for her work on that,、um, we thank you for that. It's been, it's been、uh, meaningful. So, my question, Kimura Sensei, is I think we've been changed by our relationship with Takakawa, and it's meant a lot to us. Is there anything that has, has Takakawa, how has Takakawa benefited from、uh, the exchange? Has it, has it changed anything in Takakawa at all?、Uh, yes.、Uh, how should I say?、Uh, uh, more, more and more students、uh, want, to be, uh, want to have、uh, international relationship. Uh, with uh, uh, with uh, student o- overseas. And so,、uh, t- two years ago, two、uh-huh. years ago uh, the exchange, a、uh, uh, sh- short study trip uh, to uh, Singapore uh, uh, have,、uh, have started. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, this program,、uh, uh, I think, uh, if, uh, w- without the Uh, without the、uh, exchange program、uh, between Long Meadow and Takikawa,、uh, I think、uh, this sh- short study trip uh, uh, can be re- can't r- realized. I can't realize. I couldn't realize.、Uh, there are more and more,、uh, more, and more students in Takikawa,、uh, more and more students in Takikawa are eager、uh, to have r e l a t i o n s h i p with. Uh, other countries. I think the start point of uh, this uh, is uh, uh, just uh, this pro- program, this exchange program, I think. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. that's good.、Ah, Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you. I think that you'll find, I, I think that you would find you'd get a nice warm welcome at all of our six schools in the district once you start. Um, moving around, and, and I think、um, we're so fortunate and lucky to have you. I guess, not as,、um, I guess my other question would just be a casual one that is there anything that you or your students like to do here in Massachusetts? Is, are there any places you like to visit or things you like to see once you're here on your trip?、Uh, Massachusetts? <laughs> ここに来てなんか行きたいとことかやりたいこととかはあるうん、そうそう楽し楽しみしてる。ああ、あ、they are looking forward to uh, join uh, Halloween。Good, thank、uh, me, you. Me too. You too. <laughs> I actually told them today that they could wear a costume to school, which would be unheard of in Japan. Shimura <laughs> <laughs> Sensei's like, 
really? <laughs> like, I can wear a costume? I said, yes, we will find you a costume. Because if you're going to be here for Halloween, you should definitely live it up. Because um, <laughs> the timing is always not, you know, isn't always yeah. so good. So we have to find a costume for him. So. Excellent. We are never being experienced, uh, experienced the events like this in Japan. So. Well, I hope you enjoy your Halloween. Before you leave this evening, the superintendent and the school committee would like to present you with some gifts oh, before really? you leave. Oh, okay. Uh, is Thank it you. okay? Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot. A present of Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Just give us a moment to regroup in the room. But um, next up, we're going to have our elementary SEL report. So if we want to shift and take a moment to let our team come up and um, figure out where they'd like to be seated and adjust the microphones accordingly. Okay, and they may, I wonder, let's see, they may need your chair. That's. The minutes will be light, right? Yeah. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And feel free to grab chairs and squeeze in. Is this your paper? It's okay. You know, it's not going to bother you. It's not going to bother you. Uh, there is, yeah. I got that. Absolutely. So, um, <clears throat> this is uh, the, the third in a series of reports to the school committee and really the community as a whole uh, around social emotional learning, which it's a phrase that we use frequently, and sometimes when you do that, the, the phrase loses meaning, and, and, and yet, hopefully tonight, we're able to bring meaning to that, to that phrase and help us. I think that the key to this is really understanding our efforts to support the growth of the whole child. Uh, obviously, you know, later on tonight, we'll hear a... Uh, sort of an academic report on MCAS achievement and accountability, but th this represents uh, also another important component of our work, and that is um, supporting the social and emotional growth of students. So uh, we have great teams here from the high school, we had a great team from the middle school, and uh, a great representation, great turnout from our elementary schools as well. So maybe we can um, start with some introductions. Uh, Michelle, you want to get us started? Sure. All right. Hi, Michelle Hanson, Blueberry Hill School, fifth grade. Chelsea Berry, Blueberry Hill School, math specialist. Amy Boston, principal, Blueberry Hill. Donna Hutton, principal center. Beth Nelson, principal, Wolf Swamp. Kelly Batchelor, fifth grade teacher at Wolf Swamp. Gail Levy, special ed supervisor at Wolf Swamp. Erin Kraft, um, grade three teacher at Center School. Karen Blasey, kindergarten teacher at Center School. And the mic should pick you up fine. You, 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 won't, you, can, uh, you can be comfortable as long as you might want to just keep it in between uh, each of you, uh, but no need to lean in necessarily. They're, they're, uh, it's, it's good equipment that you can relax and um, 
<laughs> Take it away. You want to intro anything else or let them get started? What's no, I think we should get started. Okay. Um, probably presentation that you need. Ready? So you've heard the high school and the middle school, and we're excited to be here because we are your children's beginning. And it's with us that they first learn to be students and to be engaged in kind members of a school community. We feel it's important for us to say and for you to know that our SEL work um, that fosters our students' self-awareness, their self-regulation and empathy, as complex and challenging as it can be at times, it also brings us tremendous joy. And at the end of the day, it's, it's this very human aspect of our work that brings us the greatest satisfaction. Caring educators, I think you know if you've been in education a long time, have always stressed social emotional skills and teaching and nurturing these competencies is equally as important as our work with academics, as Marty just said. So we have three elementary schools represented with three unique communities that we strongly feel foster social emotional learning, although we take different paths to the same goal. Our social emotional teaching and learning at each school has become the identity and the character of our schools. You're going to hear our teachers and then some of our students talk about their work. We almost wish you could hear just from our students because they are just incredible <clears throat> what they have to say um, and how they're grappling with all of these competencies. So you'll hear a little bit from them if we have time. And we hope that you'll see that the social emotional learning is not just isolated lessons or a step-by-step -step program, but a way of being and a way of life at each school. And the competencies are integrated into all we do. And as Carol Tomlinson says, SEL is a way to be together. It's ongoing embedded work accomplished by every educator in our buildings each day. So you heard from the other schools um, as well, our commitment to social emotional learning is grounded in what's called CASEL. And so CASEL stands for the Collaborative for Academic Social Emotional Learning. And you'll notice that these there are five core competencies um, from which all of our work comes from. So we have self-management, and then on the, on the to the right of that, you'll see stress management, self-discipline, self-motivation, goal-setting, organizational skills. That cohort of skills are embedded in self-management. Um, we also talk with our kids and our teachers about responsible decision-making. We model that for them. It's in everything that we do. Um, it's in our math problems. It's in our science problems. It's in our reading that we do. Um, relationship skills, those of you who are parents know how important this is. Um, so we tackle this, um, starting as Donna said, at the elementary level. Um, Social awareness is something that's really, of course, important. We teach our kids how to be empathetic, um, and some need more help with that than others, but certainly the journey is, is a good one. Um, we also focus on self-awareness, um, and you'll notice the, the goal, the um, identifying emotions, accurate self-perception, that cohort of skills um, to the left. And so that's the work we do in our classrooms, which then um, you know, builds the work for school-based activities that we do, moving into the community. And certainly, the community involves not just our families, but stakeholders within the, the greater community of Longmeadow. Um, so all of our programs address all of these competencies in some way, shape, or form. They're integrated across all contents. Um, so we are working, certainly, with our classroom teachers, with parents as partners, um, and collaboratively across schools with one another in this work. Um, and basically, we're helping students learn how to manage their behavior, how to become good, good humans, um, and empathetic, and and go out into the world and into the community, and do and do good things and move us forward. Um, so we're very committed to the castle. Um, Desi recognizes it as something that is important, um, and this is sort of a movement across across the globe. It's not just something that's unique to Massachusetts, but our sister communities are also engaged in this work as well. So this is sort of our, um, like I said before, our guiding framework and, and everything we do is connected to 
to the castle. Um, you heard that from the high school and also from the middle school. So at the elementary level, we, we start that work as well. Should not have been given this task. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Nerves and technology don't always agree. <laughs> okay. So our teachers are going to talk a little bit about um, what does success look like in the classroom, in the hallways, you know, every everywhere, in the lunchroom, all those different places. So we'll start with Blueberry Hill. Um, but you have this, of course, slide in front of you. So I'm going to let the slide stand up and, and you can read it, but also just to talk a little bit um, about the work that that we're engaged in at, at Blueberry Hill. So Michelle and Chelsea, thank you for giving up some of your night. Um, so if you could just just share with us some stories. Sure. Um, thank you so much for letting us be here. It's, it's really such a privilege to work in this district. I think we're really lucky in the fact that um, from the top down, everything we do here, it promotes the whole child. Um, we were really fortunate um, over the summer, we did some work in thinking about what this looks like throughout the school. Um, and Ms. Bastian worked with us um, to really think about, you know, whether you're in the hallway or in a classroom or at recess, um, how are we going to promote um, those, those castle um, competencies? And what does it look like to be responsible? What does it look like to be cooperative, to be empathetic, um, responsible, have self-control? <coughs> And from day one, it was wonderful. We, we met with the kids. We did that work together with them, um, not just in the six, uh, first six weeks of school, but throughout our, our days in, um, at school. What is it going to look like? Um, I felt so fortunate, and I just want to speak uh, specifically to a project. Um, last year, uh, I was grateful, um, Anne Lettahan and myself and um, Arlene McLean, we were really fortunate to be recipients of a LEAF grant that allowed us to go to um, take some mindfulness training. Um, and as you know, mindfulness is really such a wonderful movement that's been um, coming into workplaces, coming into schools, and um, what we wanted to do is then bring it back to the classroom. Um, and so just a wonderful project that Ann Lenihan, our breeding specialist, um, knowing that we wanted to have some type of product to show what the kids were learning, um, she had this great idea for the students to work on a writing project where they would become experts on um, on worry, you know, taking from their own their own soulful moments uh, when they're worried about something, um, you know, what what do they do when they worry, and taking everything we learned from the mindfulness course and then incorporating it into uh, the lessons that we were doing in the classroom around um, being mindful, using anxiety as one aspect. Um, how do we help kids? Help, help ourselves really to um, deal with our anxieties. And we learned so much, I learned so much. You know, the kids are such wonderful teachers and they were just so honest, so open with, uh, with what they did. But it became a, a great uh, touch point for so many other things we were doing in the classroom. Um, Anne is a terrific teacher. She came in and she worked with me together. We, we created units of study just within uh, writing workshop and reading workshop. Um, we were able to incorporate so much of what we do with our second step lessons, um, the language that we use, what does it mean to be flexible, um, and she and I worked together really uh, well in running a workshop and having stations where students might be doing something mindful, doing some chair yoga, um, then stepping out and being able to rotate into a writing workshop lesson, um, taking a Patricia Polacco book, uh, Thunder Cake, uh, Thunder, uh, Thunder Cake, thank you and um, looking at her writing style and then putting it right into uh, a lesson that they were doing on, on terrific leads. And the character in that story is actually quite nervous, so you know, worried about a thunderstorm. It was just so much fun to work with the kids in this, and it really was something we did all year long. But at the end, and I'm just going to leave these for um, the school committee to take a peek at some of the books that the kids ended up creating. Um, they were just really wonderful. Um, all the different stories, stories about worrying before uh, a test, um, wonderful stories about you know, being afraid of the dark, um, you're afraid you're going to lose your library book. Um, <laughs> it's a big worry. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you know, getting ready for a big presentation. Um, and it was such a gift. You know, the, the kids, they became experts. They were incorporating um, and teaching us, really, what we can do when we're worried about things. Um, so it was just such a nice marriage of everything we do. And, um, in 
you know, social emotional learning, and writing workshop, reading workshop, and um, not to compromise any one of those things. It just, they all became stronger because we could bring it together in one, one space and one time. So um, we're fortunate to be able to have those opportunities, and I, mm -hmm. I thank the school district for that, so. And all these stories that the kids wrote are now part of our library collection, so you can go in. Um, you can't check them out, but you can certainly look at them, um, and Mrs. Joyce, our librarian, will you know, bring that into the library lesson for, for the week or for the day, so it's very cool. Um, echoing that idea of um, people <coughs> collaborating and working together, I think that that's what's really shifted in this past year or so where um, I'm the math specialist, so I don't have a homeroom of kids. I just see everyone, almost. <laughs> um, and I've never really been directly involved in the social emotional learning. Yes, I try to support my students as much as possible, but now we have this shared language, we have this shared mission, we know what students are supposed to be looking for and striving for, and I'm incorporating it into the math room. Um, talking about perseverance like really explicitly um did you persevere today wow yeah that problem was so hard um you didn't give up you had the choice to give up or your friend next to you was really struggling and i saw that you didn't just give them the answer you didn't laugh at them you helped them through it you um so we're taking those small moments and really like highlighting them um what was else I was going to say? And I think that it was kind of cool because this year we um, we did these matrices at Blueberry and we talked about how does it look to care or cooperate? How does it look to be assertive? How does it look to be responsible? How does it look to show self-control in the cafeteria? Or how does it look to do it in the hallway? How does it look to do it in our classrooms, in our homerooms? Um, well, and so in the math room we did that too. And it was so powerful because every little group of kids that I would talk to, if you said, what does it mean to be empathetic? This word that maybe a couple of years ago was kind of like going over people's heads. They're like, I know what that means. Like walking in other people's shoes, thinking about their feelings, like they own it now. Ask any kid in Longmeadow, I'm sure, what it means to be empathetic and you'll get a, a right answer. Um, and the nice thing is, you can <clears throat> all our all of our classrooms. You know, you can walk into Shelly Pintusco's classroom in first grade, and you know she's got this great uh, kindness wall. You know, in a kindness jar, if a kiddo is you know struggling, um, you know, he knows there's a compliment waiting for him. Or you know, mm -hmm. great second and third grade teachers, they bring in great read alouds and just things that will touch on friendship or some of the things that we're doing, um, depending on the week. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's, it's wonderful to just see it's all incorporated. Um, it's not just we're doing social-emotional learning from 845 to 945 that day. Right. It's every part of our, our day. Even down to our standards-based report card where we're really, like, giving feedback and showing that this is important to us, that you are a flexible thinker and that um, all that stuff. And then I'm also seeing that it's, like, going out into the community a little bit because um, a couple of students would be like, oh, yeah. My coach was talking about how like we should really have self-control when things go wrong in the game and we want to yell at the ref, um, but we can't. We need to exercise self-control and so we're That's they're starting. That's not on the matrix, <laughs> yelling at the ref. <laughs> it's not on the matrix. So they're starting to make those connections out into real life and um, starting to be self-aware mm -hmm. of what that looks like. One really neat thing, um, one of our special ed teachers, Beth Manola, she's doing is um, called structured word inquiry and it's taking a word and looking at its um, background, you know, the Greek or Latin yeah. base of it. Um, and she's doing an amazing job with second, third, uh, and even fourth grade uh, classrooms and going in and <clears throat> as a station, taking words such as empathy and going to the, the base of it, you know, the path that's actually emotion and working with the kids on understanding other words that might share that, that base. Um, and the work she's doing is really amazing. Um, great posters that the kids in second grade, they're understanding cooperation, you know, taking that prefix co, you know, with operation. And it's just amazing to see how then they understand all other words that are related to that base. Um, it's just amazing. It's just exciting right now to be at our school and within the district. I know we're all doing such great work um, along this, but it's, it's nice to see it, it. It feeds into so many other pieces of what we do academically. Um, everything's reinforcing, so. Yeah, I concur with that. I just want to say, uh, Kelly Bachelor again, that I think the 
the nicest thing about the social emotional learning that we're teaching is that we've become it ourselves. Mm -hmm. I feel very, very strongly as a community, all three elementary schools, in the short time I've been in the schools, I've seen a huge shift in our own relationships and how, how empathetic we are to each other and how we work together to make a difference for the kids. I'll start with that. And if you don't mind, I'll just read from my five-minute draft I created after my <laughs> conference call. Um, good evening, and thank you for allowing me this opportunity to speak to you about how I practice the core components of social-emotional learning in my classroom. To me, there is nothing more important in a child's education than how they feel about themselves, how they treat themselves, and then how they treat others in that order. Teaching and modeling self-awareness in my classroom comes first. The children learn that self-awareness helps them to know their strengths and how their strengths can help them to meet their challenges. From the first day of school, I work with students to self-reflect on a one-to-one -one level to a whole group setting. We work hard to define what self-awareness and self-management means and how and when they should be applying these skills. <clears throat> one way I do that, in a way they enjoy, is when I dismiss students to move from a whole group lesson and a guided practice to independent work is I might ask them to think about what actors do when they are on a stage, how long it takes them to move from scene to scene, in their case, task to task, how prepared they are for their part, <clears throat> and how the audience feels as they observe them. I guide students to pretend they're actors thinking about their roles as they move about the room from task to task, knowing the audience is watching them as they do, cameras are rolling, lights are on them, and the director calls action with the expectation that the scene should take approximately two to three minutes before we are on to the next scene. In this role playing, students have come to understand that they should be thinking about what they should be doing. I remind students to understand that the difference in their own lives and the parts they play in at home, in school, and with their friends are even more important than the actors' parts because in their case, it's real life. We discuss how good they feel about their choices to do well on that stage and how they should want to shine even more in their own lives simply because they just proved they can. These skills follow students to small group where I also teach them how to be responsible by working together, how to listen without interruption, how to communicate, and how to be ready for me before I even arrive at the guided reading table <clears throat> and telling me where we are at since we last met. I do my best to let them run the group once they know how to as I guide them gently through analyzing the text they are reading and making them feel good about their thinking so they continue to do it. On a teacher to student level, I strive to know the whole child so that I can in turn help them to see the same about themselves. <laughs> for example, for the child who struggles to sit and read a book, it is his raised hand I will take when I do the read aloud about empathy because he shines in a whole group setting of the carpet and wants to be heard. He has good ideas as he analyzes what we read. And it is that child who enthusiastically asks me to spend more time on that read aloud because he has more ideas he wants to share. He feels good about himself because he recognizes this new strength. Another example might be when a child raises their hand but feels uncertain about taking that chance to answer the question. Noticing that, I immediately praise her for being bold and taking a chance and ask her to notice that she did the same. And then there's the child who struggles with being ready for class. Perhaps he or she left their independent reading book at home instead of bringing it to school. I understand the need for strategies and I let the child know that I need those strategies as much as they do. I then work with the child to figure out why and not come to the conclusion that he or she will always be that kid who won't remember what they need to have to be ready for school. In this case, perhaps it meant just taking their binder with them to the couch when they read the night before and bringing that with them so that when they finish reading, they can just put it back in their binder. It's okay, it's just a strategy you need. It is my goal through these two key areas that students come to <coughs> understand how beautiful they present as they give the best parts of themselves throughout the day in every choice <coughs> that they make. It's important to note here that as they learn these skills, they understand it takes practice, that they won't fail at this, because all it takes is practice, so we do that every day. If it means making a stronger line from the cafeteria to the classroom, or coming back to the circle to go to the next, next task more efficiently, simple reminders that help students to develop these skills, <coughs> these skills are key. As children learn to assert themselves through self-awareness and gain self-management skills, I also practice teaching, teaching and modeling social awareness and relationship skills every day. 
For example, we begin our day as a whole group at morning meeting where children come to feel valued and find the opportunity to greet one another, share something about themselves, and do a special activity. Our responsive classroom practices have merged with our CARES <clears throat> social emotional expectations in many ways in our meeting. For example, I remind students that a true circle means we are all equal and important and to make sure no one is outside of it. I use the legend of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table to show everyone is equal and has an important role in our classroom with the understanding we need everyone to be a strong team. When we are all together, side conversations cease and we are ready to be together. Our safe space where children learn to trust one another is a place where we talk about our differences and our commonalities, our cultures and our families, where we get to know one another by sharing and asking questions or offering positive comments and that noticing our differences are important so that we can rely on each other. Last year, I had several students ask if they could share special things about themselves to the group as we got closer to understanding how we felt trusting to each other. One boy asked me if he could tell the group about his particular diagnosis. I asked him if he knew what the diagnosis meant, and though he had some idea, he wasn't completely sure. With family permission, we watched a video together so that he felt ready to tell the other students. I don't think I need to tell you that meeting, how that meeting went, how many questions were asked, how grateful his family was, and how somehow the choice he made that day broke down the barriers that I believe will reward him for the rest of his life. Other activities I've done have also helped students in every one of the social emotional components we are talking about. I created one activity that my team uses that the children love, a modified version of the spider web greeting. The, the spider web greeting is fun in itself because students pass a ball of yarn to one another to say hello, making sure to work as a team to hold on to the yarn piece they get as they pass it to the next person they greet. By the time they finish, they created a pretty cool constellation of yarn. My modified version, Scale the Mountain, is the same activity, but I use a different set of language. The children are asked to imagine themselves standing as a team at the base of a mountain, ready to climb an icy ridge, knowing that if there's a weak link in the team, they won't make it. The yarn becomes their rope, their lifeline, and if they don't work together, somehow someone might get hurt. Before and as we climb the mountain, we talk about each of our unique differences and how that will help us to reach our goal. As we begin climbing and getting excited, students are careful enough to fool around so they can pay attention to each other and take care of each other to make the goal. If one person doesn't throw the rope far enough to the next person climbing the mountain, then how can we all help and cooperate to help them? Do we yell or we laugh at each other or do we <coughs> ask our team captain, the person with the strongest voice in the room, we voted to be the captain, to figure out who would be the next best person to throw it carefully again? We look for the strengths we each have to make it work. Maybe our guide only speaks Spanish. Who in, the sp who in our circle can speak to our guide, our L student? Maybe our athletes can use their skills to hold the longest lines, thankfully, but who can pay attention to the ice that's cracking around us to keep us from walking into dangerous territory? When we think carefully about it, we show empathy to those who are our best listeners, the quietest people in our class, and elect them to take the job. Every child learns that every other child is useful and makes a difference to help us get through this activity. <coughs> we learn to respect each other. There are many ways I teach and model these practices from teaching students to be responsible citizens through their jobs, clean lockers, helping others, keeping their classrooms looking its best for visitors, welcome visitors, and so much more. All of our team did a lesson right at the board, uh, bulletin board to talk about our cares once again, how it looks, what we've learned, and how we can take it further. Every student added their thoughts to that bulletin board and signed their name. Finally, I believe every child should be taught how to use their voice. After all these components are taught and by the end of the year, I look for opportunities to use the speaking and listening standards more ways than a book presentation. For example, last year I began debate in my classroom. The children voted on a topic and learned how to debate, including debate etiquette, and learned debate etiquette, being ready to stand for the opposition or the proposition, and for sure, working as a team. The way I addressed those students I knew would have difficulty with speaking and with listening was to practice the debate, like a play, until they were ready to actually debate against their opposing team. And I saw growth in every child. We will certainly do it again. I've also obtained a grant to start an after-school TED Ed Club. For those who aren't familiar with TED Talks, 
This club is bringing millions of children together around the world <coughs> to learn how to take an idea, they're something they're curious about, their passions, and turn it into great short talks that are filmed and uploaded onto the TED Ed Club Forum. The best part of this club is we will connect with other classrooms around the world through a connect platform that TED provides to discuss those ideas and just get to know students outside of Longmeadow in places like Japan, British Columbia, Nepal, Central America, England, Africa, and more. We are very excited to see this future generation reach out and gain, gain even more social awareness and empathy as we do. There has been an enormous effort put forth at Wolfstrom through our CARES program from before children entering the school to when they enter the classroom, walk down the halls, go to their specials, lunch and recess, teachers are with them most of these times. And in our whole community gatherings where we come together to celebrate who we are and all we have accomplished through this program. Through our constantly improving social emotional teaching, we are not divided into classrooms, we are one school. We are now a bigger school than that. We are a big community. There's no doubt that when these practices are consistently taught, modeled, and then expected through the entire community, it is the happy, hardworking, reflective child that demonstrates the evidence we need to believe <clears throat> it to be true. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So just to add on to what Kelly has, has said by very specific examples, so we do have a model that we practice that we all believe in, that we've developed together. It's called the CARES model, and it does align very closely with CASEL. Um, and we do talk about cooperation, assertion, and responsibility, empathy, and self-control. So we know that we are a school. Our job is teaching and learning. That's what we do. And our social-emotional practices is how we do it. So we're really paying attention to, to the whole child, to what children need to be their best selves, to be confident, to be relaxed, um, to pay attention, to fully engage, to be respectful, and to work together. And we teach it explicitly, we model it, and we practice it every day, all of us. Thanks, Gail. Um, so I'm Erin Aaron Kraft from Center School. Um, I wanted to talk about our Peace Builders program. And um, I think the thing, the common theme that I'm hearing is sort of how um, it's a way of life and it's embedded in all that we do. Um, I like the fact that we have a structure with the Peace Builders program. Um, it integrates um, certain practices that are named in our pledge and it's said daily. Um, the behaviors that are explicitly taught are Praising people, giving up put downs, seeking wise people, noticing hurts, righting wrongs, helping others. And then we also have another um, kind of piece that um, lends itself to reaching out in the community. Um, it's a school wide implementation plan that we have. So um, throughout the year, we're all working on the same practice at the same time. <coughs> and letters go home so families can also kind of piggyback on that, that theme and um, talk about it with their children at home as well. Um, the practices help students to grow empathy, self-awareness, build those positive relationships, and learn responsible decision-making. Um, these areas are being constantly readdressed throughout the year as students face various situations with peers. Um, we have a conflict wheel that comes with our Peace Builders program, and so if need be, you know, it can help students, you know, when you need to redirect or kind of solve a problem, working together to, first of all, identify what the problem is, and then how can we figure out how to solve that kind of thing. Um, there are a lot of tools that are available within the program, and then, you know, teachers, just being good teachers, have a lot of their own bag of tricks as well, but this constant, you know, this, I think the most important thing here is this, con the messaging that we have is no matter where our students go, if they go to art or music, um, we're using that common language and saying like what a peace builder you are and the students understand what that means. They know what that looks like, what it sounds like because we've already done those explicit lessons in our classroom. Um, we have school-wide assemblies um, kind of reinforcing the different um, kind of practices. Um, and then also the Helping Hands program which is uh, reaching out to the community by making sandwiches um, for those in need. Um, I wanted to talk just a couple of things in the classroom and then 
Karen's going to tell about some other lessons that she's done. Um, but one thing that um, I've done is a praise circle in my classroom, which um, we could do right here, but we won't. <laughs> <laughs> but we're in a circle, and you would pass praise to your neighbor. So I usually give students time to kind of figure out who they're sitting next to and give them that think time. Um, and we talk a lot about how the praise that you would give to someone would be um, inside praise um, rather than, you know, cool shoes or I love your shirt, you know, which is definitely probably more so when you're in the younger stages. But as you get to third grade, we can start to uh, reinforce those um, I love what you did or what a smart thing you did um, today in math or I couldn't believe your strategy. That was really cool. Good thinking. Or, and I've started a, a wall in my classroom where I have um, students like catch someone and praise them anonymously. And it's getting to the point where it's, you know, like we've got to re renovate the wall or something. But <laughs> it's great because um, they are just noticing like what a good thinker you were today or you were really quiet during independent reading that helped us um, to feel peaceful. So the kids even understand the language and are able to sort of um, talk that way. Um, also, we brought a lot of books because um, during Reader's Workshop, for example, we can take a text that's a wonderful text and talk about the characters within that text um, and you know whether they are or not peace builders and what qualities we um, like or don't like and how we could um, you know, emulate them or not. So Karen was going to talk about some lessons she's done in kindergarten. Yeah. So I teach kindergarten, and of course, you know the famous slogan, everything you need to know you learn in kindergarten. <laughs> and the big part of kindergarten is all about the social-emotional learning. Um, I think that comes before even the academic. And so it has been just joyous to watch the kids with Peace Builders because they take it, first of all, so literally, and trying to explain the different parts of the pledge to them you know, like, what's a put down? Because they don't understand that kind of a word, but they certainly know. We'll use things like praising people. They have gotten to understand that. We'll talk about give someone a warm and fuzzy. Say nice things to people, and you model it, and you do it. So we have just a couple of cutesy little mm -hmm. things that you can, you know, we have, like, praise bracelets. So this simple one was some little boy. Um, he came right over when I played my morning music, and I gave him a praise bracelet right away because this person doesn't always come right over when I play my morning music. So it's another way to kind of foster the routines and the rules of the school by praising them. Um, obviously touches on the self-confidence, um, how they feel about themselves, and one of the biggest things in our program is praising people, which has been our first month focus, because in every grade, I, I want my kids to be happy coming to school every day. Like if you're not happy coming to kindergarten, you know, I'm, I'm in trouble, because mm -hmm. They should love it, and especially with the demands that are on everybody. But as you all know, we're in full-day kindergarten now. We have a lot more academics, so you want the kids to feel good about themselves. So some of the cute other things we do, um, we first started at the beginning of what is peace, because the name of our program is Peace Builder. So we start with the very <coughs> basics, and um, we do a lot of um, brainstorming and stuff. So I have a booklet here, but just the way kids think about peace, you know, getting half of something. You know, because they wanted to say sharing. But, you know, their words, it's just so cute to hear them. Um, being in a tent with best friends. So you, you think peace is going to be, oh, quiet, not to talk, being good to children, loving your teachers, asking a friend that gets hurt if they're okay. Just, they, you know, they say the darndest things, but they're honest. So as far as building on the peace and then praising, um, we do a lot with as far as the team building part. In kindergarten, a couple of things I've done um, at the beginning of the year to teach them rules and routines, we have a, a beautiful block center. And a lot of times, you have kids parallel playing. So this one's building with these blocks, and this one's building over here, and you can't have those blocks, whatever. So what we do is at the beginning of the year, we make a class building. And everybody takes some blocks off the shelf, and we build a community building to show that everybody is part of it and that they can play together. So that hopefully when they are in their choice time and they're trying to, you know, use some of the equipment and we might not have enough for everybody, they kind of can use some of those rules. Um, the other thing we have, and someone touched on it, just motivating the whole class to want to be part of being a peace builder. I have um, a peace token jar where I just drop peace tokens in every time I catch somebody or I hear that someone has, you know, followed the rules, done a good deed. Um, mm -hmm. It's funny. 
they, you know, someone will say to me, oh, Mrs., uh, I like your shoes. Or to the other kids, because the praise for them is definitely Literal. outside right yeah, now. Outside I like your tie, I like your shirt. <laughs> and so today we were using a praise bear, where in order when you held the bear, someone had to say to you, I like you because. So we kind of got away from the outside, except a few, I like you because you have new shoes. <laughs> <laughs> but others were, I like you because you played with me today. Yeah. Or I liked you because you helped me find my name tag in the bucket. So trying to reach in, like I like the way you said it, from the outside to the inside. Um, one of the other things, it's, they need visuals, they need the modeling, um, the put downs. So what we use is kind of a put down is more than a warm and fuzzy, it's kind of a cold and prickly. And they get that from using a, you know, seeing a hedgehog or something. Mm -hmm. And one of the um, activities that we've done, and I'll let Erin uh, explain it, it's, it's taking a heart mm -hmm. and showing how unkind words can really leave a lasting effect mm -hmm. on anybody from, you know, baby to grown-ups. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we've done this before where we've, um, I've either provided the put-downs, sometimes I've done that where I've actually given them so they don't have to come up with them on their own, um, or, you know, sharing a moment when something was hurtful to you, or either you gave a put-down or someone gave you a put-down, and of course, no names. <laughs> and um, as we do, as they give the put-down, we crumple up the heart and we crumple it up each time, each time, each time. And then at the end, I try to smooth it out, but we, we talk about what do you notice, and while we can right our wrongs, which is what you, you need to do if you've done something you wish you didn't, um, we still see that it, the damage has, has been done to the heart. And so sort of thinking before you speak or before you act to try to, you know, kind of that self-control piece that we talk about. So it, it's a very good visual for them to see um, how their words do have power and meaning to mm -hmm. others. And they're also very good at remembering. Um, Donna read this book at one of our first assemblies, The Smallest Girl in the Smallest mm -hmm. Grade. So it really was pertinent to kindergarten because we're <laughs> the smallest, the smallest grade and whatever. And, and every time something happens now in the school, whether someone will speak up for somebody or they'll, they'll be, oh, that's like Sally. <laughs> so they need, they need the visual. I do a lot with the literature, as someone else was saying. Um, <coughs> Swimmy is a real old favorite. And it's all teamwork on how to how to um, work against a big fish that was eating all the other fish. They all swam together as a team. They were able to you know solve that problem. Rainbow fish, which you probably remember these when you were kids. Um, you know he didn't want to share his scales because he thought he was beautiful and how could he do it? Well, then he found out after he shared them, he was the happiest fish because everybody wanted to play with him. So we do lots mm -hmm. of role modeling, reading the stories, and finding characters um, where the kids can relate to. Uh, through all the different uh, components of, of Peace Builders. The funny thing is the kids now, like instead of coming up and saying to me, um, you know, Aaron did this, what they'll say is, Aaron's not being a Peace Builder. <laughs> you know, like they use the language. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just cute and I just have to show you, we, we do a lot of singing in kindergarten. I, I think sometimes I'm just, <clears throat> they think I sing because I like it, but the songs we sing are usually to get them gathered and ready to sit and listen. Um, so we have a Peace Builder song that we sing for lining up and all kindergartners do it. So I did tell Donna I would sing it, but I felt it was better if uh, you could hear these guys. Uh, I think you'll be able to hear it. You can. Um, it's just so funny because um, Donna was noticing, like, it's a very short song. We sing it every day, several times a day when we're leaving the classroom, and the kids will just automatically start doing it when we're out at recess, you know. I can't tell you they all have their hands behind them when they're singing it, but they, they, they understand that that's what they're supposed to do when they're lining up, so. Um, it's a work in progress. It is a work in progress, but, you know, they, they are already understanding what they need to do to be a peace builder, and my job is to get to take all the components of the Peace Builder program, you know, seeking wise people, what does that mean? So for each one, we role model, we t explicitly teach the, the component, and then we do lots of projects, whether it's math, reading, writing, um, to help them and to model it. Now, I have the difficult task of following up all the fabulous teachings. Um, <laughs> but I think 
you know, after listening to what everybody had to share today, and you know, certainly the words are up there, I think what's most important is that while we may have different programs and philosophies, our foundation is grounded in the castle. Um, we heard from Mrs. Cadiz talking about how explicitly it is taught in kindergarten and the level of instruction that is provided so that kids begin to understand what that means. And then listening to Mrs. Bachelor, our fifth grade teacher, being able to talk about how students are then taking that information as fifth graders and really applying it to their day-to-day -day life and, their, and building those relationships and becoming part of a larger community. Um, being able to share a very personal and specific diagnosis and have your classmates show empathy and curiosity about that and learn from that and grow. And I think when we are <coughs> going to work each and every day, it is because we love children and we want to help children and we want to continue to move them forward by building that foundation that's starting in kindergarten um, and embracing all that they are as whole children. Um, throughout the listening to all of the teachers talk today, you hear the common language, you hear the common understandings. Um, you know, at, at center they're seeking a wise person, but you know, in Blueberry you're going to hear from the students that kindness rocks. And at, at the end of the day, we all have ways of making sure that our students know what the expectations are. It's modeled explicitly. It's taught in isolation. It is taught as part of every fabric that we do. Um, and there's a commonality amongst all three schools. I have a staff member who joined me this year from center. And she said her transition was so easy because what we are doing is so aligned with Peace Builders. The, the philosophy of what our work is and what we're embedded in um, was so seamless for her. And I know I have a staff member who is now at Blueberry Hill this year and she shared the same thing, how easy it was to go to Blueberry Hill. Um, she's no longer at Wilson, she's at Blueberry Hill. But because of the commonality of the three schools and what we're doing and what we're embedded in and how passionate we are in the work that we're doing each and every day. Um, literature was a really big focus in everything that I heard today. Um, we have, you know, a CARES library in our school where we've made a huge, enormous investment so that teachers have picture books and chapter books so that when there is perhaps um, a problem in their classroom or something that needs to be addressed, sometimes we do need to go to books because it's developmentally appropriate for our students. Um, it's easier to have that conversation and share somebody else's story than the story that may have played out in the playground that day. Um, students can relate and they can understand and have that empathy and grow and understand from that. Um, so I think I'll move from there. And the, the science of successes, we've all, I mean, I am copied on all of the emails that Donna and Amy both send, so I'm, I always know what's going on because we talk and meet all the time but they share that with their communities as well and it's very helpful. Um, we have, we've all found different ways of communicating the important work that we're doing at each of our schools with our families and making sure that our families feel um, that they understand the work that we're doing, why we're doing it, um, and that we're always open to having a greater dialogue if we need to have that dialogue. Um, I know Donna hosted a, a Peace Builders Open House last year um, Amy had an entire week of the week of hellos this year. We've done, um, even though it was a Mike Flynn math night last year, we put a lot of focus into making sure that it was an evening for students as well as their parents. Um, and there was a lot of work for the student piece that went into the social emotional, although that was based in mathematics. Um, center stage, the, the center stage that Donna has this year, just another way of her cafeteria being such a warm and wonderful environment for students. And um, I know we're all going to be asking Mr. Mazza for a lot of extra money next year um, to make our cafeteria that same model. Um, but we're constantly striving and working to do what is in the best interest of each and every one of our students um, and meeting them where they are each and every day, knowing that they're all at different places on this journey. So the thing we look at is what kind of information are we, are we getting? What is our data telling us? Um, so there's a couple, a few different ways that we do collect data uh, based on the work that, that we're doing. Um, we've now, moving towards our standards-based report card, we're not moving towards, we are there. Um, so we're reporting on, on students' work within each standard. Um, we also are looking at behaviors, so academic and social-emotional behaviors that support students' learning. Chelsea talked about perseverance, and so we're actually, we're seeing wh what kids are doing. Are they meeting that? Are they approaching? You know, do they still need levels of support with that? What kind of support? Um, and, and those nine behaviors that we're assessing, 
starting kindergarten, pre preschool even, um, we may not assess them with the exact same report card, but certainly K through five, um, the kids are, we're looking to, to their behavior, what they're doing, um, and how is it affecting their learning. Um, so classroom teachers spent a great deal of time, not just looking at math data, but looking at anecdotal data that they have about things that are happening within their classroom um, and there are times where we do have to take a break and say okay let's circle up what are we doing um, and so teachers are making note of that um, and solving problems all the time um, we look at our office referral data you know from years past from month to month different locations um, are we trending in one direction are we are we not um, you know, recess, I think a lot of us have spent a, a lot of time looking at best practice in, you know, during that lunch and recess time. Um, all from, you know, putting up matrix, you know, matrices to redesigning cafeterias, you know, and there are just so many ways that we're looking at, um, at responding to what that data is telling us. We send, our school councils are sending out surveys annually. Um, I know last year being my first year at Blueberry Hill, we now have baseline data and that we will compare next year. And that's something that we're all, all three schools are, are looking at doing this year as well. Um, we each have leadership teams in some, some way, um, shape, or form. And so we look at, um, you know, feedback from the teachers month to month. What's happening in the classroom? Is this something, um, are there kind of current events, you know, things that are happening in the community or in the world that are affecting our students? So we sometimes talk about those um, pieces of data. And then we look at our M class, uh, our school climate survey, that's specific to fifth grade. Um, so we are still waiting for that data, but that's something that we look at um, as well. And the kids talk about that. Um, do you, you know, I remember after fifth grade, they said, do you know what they asked us? You know, they asked us, are there mean kids at the school? Um, and so that's important to have those conversations. We do all have monthly themes that we are committed to as well. Um, we talked about, I know you have Wolfpack gatherings and you know Center School and Blueberry also have monthly assemblies tied into um, what we're doing for the month. It's very similar. Um, so that's just some of the data that we're collecting that informs our instruction and kind of guides our, our work that we're doing. Because although we have month by month curriculum that we are working with, we're very flexible and we realize that we also have to meet, like Beth said, kids where they're at um, so although we don't talk about self-control until the end of the school year, we certainly um, need to revisit that or, or visit it um, at the start of the school year. So that's some of the, the data that we're using to, to drive uh, what we're doing. And then how will we grow? Um, the great thing about working with small humans is that they're always changing and they're always um, giving us uh, reason to look back at our practices and, and become better. So we, we, do, we know we need to grow. Um, so we're, we're gonna be looking to our students and our teachers and our, and our families for giving us some feedback on our standards-based report card, not just the academic standards, but also those, those learning standards. Um, we are collectively with our school councils looking at surveys for our students. Um, what, do, what, kind of sur what does that look like in kindergarten or, and what does that look like you know, versus <coughs> surveying fifth grade students? and then continuing to look at our climate data. Um, through CASEL, uh, there are some really great surveys that they suggest. Our programs that we're using also have um, surveys that we're, we're looking at with our faculty and with our school improvement, uh, with our um, school councils using our school improvement plan. We, we know that that's an area that we need to grow in. Um, and also we are now, because each of us has been you know, embedded with this work over more than one or two years with our, you know, respective programs, our teachers are starting to become the experts. Um, so there, we're starting to do a little bit more embedded professional development um, and building leadership from within with our with our staff. So that's exciting. Um, just the leadership teams, the ongoing work at each program, at each school. We all have a leadership team. Um, we all have teams that meet to specifically address social emotional needs um, and the social emotional learning in the school so that we continue to move forward. So whether it is um, second step in cares or peace builders or responsive classroom in cares, we're constantly refining what we're doing and making sure that what we're doing is applicable to the students who are in front of us on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and I think that it's, it's a constant dialogue 
and a pulse of what's going on in the building to make sure that we're meeting each of those needs. Um, we work we work pretty closely with our school adjustment counselors as well. You know, they're um, they have a really good professional pulse on on what's trending, what's happening, not just with how our program addresses bullying, for example, um, but also you know how to how to deal with those you know students who need a little bit more support. Um, maybe they need a tier a second tier intervention or beyond. Um, so. Although they're not here tonight, they're so present in, in those decisions and the work that we're doing school-wide. So they're, they're very entrenched um, on those leadership teams and in the work that we're doing as well. I just wanted to make sure that everyone knows I mean, Going that. along with that, that's one of the areas we know we need to grow and it's an area we grapple with. Dusty recommends a tiered approach to social emotional learning. So we know that all of our students are going to get that high quality instruction with the core competencies. And then some of our students are going to need more intervention. They might need a social group. They might need work with the adjustment council, um, counselor. But then we also have a few students who need even more intensive work. And those are the students that we're grappling with. And we know that we have to um, come up with some ways to address their very complex challenges. So that's an area we know that we want to grow and, and we want to, um, especially working with our adjustment counselors in that area. And I think our teachers will agree with that. Those, those, are, the, those are the students that um, we really <coughs> want to do a really good job with. All of our students, but certainly those students, those few that need that more intensive support. And then we're going to be discussing more with our, our middle school that transition into the middle school, not just with the SEL program, but with our academics. And, and we're, we're talking now about making that part of our school improvement plans, you know, to have that as a goal and, and have some very specific action steps so that we make sure that we are aligned and we have a full understanding of what's happening between the elementary and our middle school. <coughs> We have um, a video, but in the interest of time, I don't know if we want to show it. It's it's 29 minutes, <laughs> and it's our students. It's talking. really great, though. It's yeah. really fabulous. But I know you have your MCAS presentation. But what we did is we asked our Sue's like show the video. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we asked our students some questions that we thought would speak to the competencies and we wanted to hear their voice and we wanted them to speak um, about d the different programs and there's there's some really epic comments in there <laughs> so um, now I'm I'm saying it so you'll want to see it but drum roll I know I you have a long thing see. ahead of you see and for a little red sox are on. Maybe just half of it. make sure you see it pieces of entirety piece. but I feel like we should see some of it so so what it is is that it I, I starts it. we we sort of went <laughs> we in alphabetical order I mean, we went well not really went blueberry will swamp and then center and we have groups of students and the cameras on them and we're asking them the questions and they just talk to us so it's 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 sort of Almost unedited. It's, it's, it's raw and un un unrehearsed. Is there a way to see a bit of top my head? School? I'm wondering yeah. if yeah. we yeah. can, yeah. if you can send the school yeah. committee yeah. the link of it. the video Absolutely. in its entirety yeah. 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 for us yeah. to be able to yeah. watch the whole thing, but maybe for now. <coughs> Play a little bit like we a did kind of promise a, our kids they would be on TV. Yeah, like a little so. video vignette of them. <laughs> Can you do a little bit from each school? From each school? Just right. to hear. Do you trust me to? Sure. We're putting a lot of All pressure right. on you, <laughs> Jane, to edit. Yeah. And my blooper was here. before. I'm good now, so we're, we're fine. <laughs> I'm gonna skip the music. Good sound. It's a great song. <laughs> some things you do when you have a conflict or a problem at school. You should tell the teacher. Okay. Um, if it's small enough for like me to handle, um, if it's small enough for like me to handle, I try to handle it on my own. But like if it's something that I can't handle by myself, um, I get um, help whether that's a teacher or a parent. Great. Um, what are some ways that you take care of your friends? Um, by making sure you're not left out. Um, if they're sitting by themselves at lunch or something, you should let them come sit with you. Mm -hmm. Um, like, just be a good friend and kind of, like, just be with them. 
Um, if you're so if they're stuck on like um, a math problem, you're allowed to help them. You can like help them understand um, and stuff. Have you guys ever helped anybody in the buddy bench? Yeah. 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 So what does that look like? You walk over to them and ask if they want to play. But if they don't want to play, you can um, just ask if you want to play later, or if you just want to sit down with them. Sure. Mm -hmm. Cool. Can you talk about some things that happen in your class or at our school that students do to help others? What have you seen? Um, so in my class last year, uh, we made books. So Brennan, well, he's going to talk about the books that Michelle, Can so I'm going to skip things. over that. All right. He makes that <laughs> Really great books. <laughs> <laughs> responsible in your classroom like you talked about like, how are you like if they would know what they would probably know what to do if you would all right so so these are now students from wolf swamp school what are some ways that you take care of your friends um if some if one of your friends is on the buddy bench you can ask them to play with you um if they're stuck on a problem you can help them or tell them that you can go to the teacher for help. Like if they fall, you could walk into the nurse's office. Can you talk about some things that happen in your class or your school that students do to help one another? Um, you can, um, you can, if you didn't make a mess, um, during choice time on Fridays, um, you can still help the other people pick it up if it's almost time to go to your special. If you're first, if you're in second grade. <laughs> if your friend um, is in a problem with somebody else, you can help them or help them talk to the teacher. If your friend is like not feeling that well and like they're kind of sad, you could help them. And why do you think it's important to help others? Um, because if you don't, they're just going to feel um, that same badness for a long time. Um, if you don't help them, their self-confidence will go down and they don't believe that they won't be able to achieve much because of that one problem that happened to them. You could... You could help them by, you could help them like if you see one of them just walking around, you could ask them and then if you become friends with them, you will become better friends with them and then they'll never be alone. Do you ever feel stressed or nervous? And if so, what are the kind of things that you would do um, when you feel this way? Um, if I'm playing in my room with my sister and I get stressed or nervous about the thing we're doing, um, I would excuse myself from the situation, go into my bed, and think of some happy thoughts I hear. I was nervous or stressed. I'd try to like, talk with people and just, while talking, you just fade away and I wouldn't really care about it. I would wrap my feet around my chair. What do you think it means to be responsible? Recess or whatever you're doing at whatever time, go over and stand up to that bully. Yeah, also, even if it's not your friend being bullied or even not being bullied, it's just, it's good to stand up for others, even for little things like calling someone a name is like, can you talk about some things that happen in your class or at center school that students do to help others? Um, well, there's helping hands, and around um, the holidays we do um, the gift baskets for people in need. I, so I and some other kids in my class help our teacher out because they already have a lot of stuff going around in the class. 
So then, like, helping them will usually make their day and make them happy. Yeah, I'm, well, I'm not part of this event, but I'm pretty sure Michael is, where, like, you donate school supplies to oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. other um, schools that are in need. What are they called? I forget at the end of the school year. Uh, helping hands is basically like where you make sandwiches. Mm -hmm. Even the tiniest, um, even the tiniest things that happen can lead to bigger things. Mm -hmm. So it's always good to um, be involved if something happens. Um, like, um, like helping out, like give a praise. The, the tiniest things can help out and lead to bigger things. You give one praise, it can make a huge difference. It's like when we have praise notes, which we can give to other people, and like cards from other people who mm -hmm. like praise people, like good job with doing your homework. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do any of you ever feel stressed or nervous? I know that I do, or all of you do sometimes. So what kinds of things do you do at center school when you feel this way? I usually either like need to like, take a break or like go for a walk or draw for a couple minutes. Yeah, and you can do like finger stretches or shoulder rolls and that helps you. Oh, you can just relax yourself, focus on something else. And Try to forget about it. Well, if you try to forget about it, then that's putting more weight on the shoulders then. So then eventually, it feels like you have so much pressure then. Like just do what relaxes you, like write, a, write something, read something, draw something. Um, come on, I like to close my eyes, take a deep breath, and take a walk with my squishy and just push it for a couple minutes, I'll be down the hallway, and I'll go back to my classroom. Mm -hmm. No? Okay. <laughs> So from squishies to walking in the hallway to cupcakes and unicorns. Um, yeah, that's really, I'm not sure how you quantify that. Yeah, we'll share the link with you. Yeah, you'll, you'll yeah. enjoy it. That's why we're here, too. Yeah. All right, what can you do when you do Do you have questions? Yes, before I open it up to the rest of my colleagues, um, thank you for sharing the little video um, vignette and I will say the little girl from Wolf Swamp on the right with the glasses <laughs> in full public disclosure being chair of the skin school committee is stressful and causes anxiety <laughs> and that little girl I'm gonna go home go to my bed and think happy thoughts <laughs> that is my motto from now on and then maybe some shoulder rolls um, during the meeting and then somebody can get me a squishy that would be great so that that was a great way to, to, to end that, but I'll open it, up, open it up to the committee for any questions um, or comments on the presentation. I will. Ryan, we'll start with you. Thank you all very much. Um, as a principal, I love it when you all present because I sit here and take notes and figure out what I'm gonna steal <laughs> and then go use in my own school, so I appreciate I got about 10 things. Um, my question though is, uh, the, the girls who talked earlier, the girls from Japan, were talking about how our students have no problem sharing their opinion with everyone and we just saw some more examples about it. Do you ever have any opportunities for your fifth graders to be leaders for the younger kids in your school and model mm -hmm. the social emotional stuff that you all do? I should have addressed that. Mm -hmm. So at Center School, um, even before Peace Builders, I think we've had what's called fifth grade buddies. We now do, re we <coughs> rename them the fifth grade Peace Pals, <coughs> go along. And so um, once a month we have a structured lesson where the fifth graders will come into the kindergarten classrooms and we have paired up each fifth grader with a kindergartner or depending on numbers, you know, somebody might have two peace pals. <clears throat> and the fifth grade teachers and the kindergarten teachers get together monthly to plan lessons. Um, as a matter of fact, this Friday we are going um, out for a nature walk and we will be doing a little science project. We're studying trees in kindergarten, trees and weather. So we will be making um, fall collages after reading Lois Ellert's The Leaf Man. Mm -hmm. So that's a monthly project that's structured. However, to go along with Peace Builders Weekly, depending on um, the schedule, they get to play with it. Fifth grade happens to eat lunch with kindergarten at our school. We have the same lunch period. So some days they get to have a buddy lunch 
which means they actually get to sit at the different tables with their fifth grade peace pal Good. instead of sitting separately with kindergarten. And then uh, more often than that, they get to play with each other at recess. So they can use the big playscape, the small playscape, and so I don't know if you want to add anything, but I forgot to mention peace pals. So at Wolfpack, at our Wolfpack gatherings, we've created a team of pack pals. So fifth grade gets matched with some of the younger team grades, and I think each year it's changed grade to grade, where we spend time together and do activities together, um, take a host month together, and present together. So this month, for example, I'm with a second grade team that we've done a field trip to, each, to our classrooms, we've said hello, we've had this, children have discussed, they each have a friend, they'll move on to another friend, we've done an activity together. Um, they will then present at the next Wolfpack gathering, something we're gonna do for the outside community for Veterans Day. <coughs> every team does that every month. Um, so that's one way. Another way is they have jobs throughout the school. I'm sure all of our fifth graders have that in all our schools. Mm -hmm. And this gives them an opportunity to present to the rest of the school the different things they do and how they're responsible for that. And they work with those grades. So for example, kindergarten helpers walk the kids down to their classrooms. Um, we have kids who recycle and they see all of these jobs being done. Um, another thing that we're working on that's been very successful is our Storytellers mm -hmm. Program, where our fifth graders and our fourth graders, I think our fifth graders only this year, learn how to tell a story. They do it through a master storyteller without a script to the different <coughs> grades in the school. They'll present that skill by going to the younger grades to teach. Those are three things off the top of my head. Great. Thank you. So we have similar practices. Um, I think we all have safety, our fifth grade safety patrol. So mm -hmm. they take a leadership role um, each season and, and help keep us safe. And mainly their job, the coveted job of the safeties is the kindergarten, to be kindergarten <laughs> safety. Um, so they are um, very interested in helping the kids walk in, um, providing a, a, safe, a safe way to, to walk into the school. Um, we've paired up this year. We have our third graders and our fifth graders together at recess. Um, so the older kids are able to model, um, hopefully, um, positive behaviors at recess. So I think I think it's something that we want to explore a little bit more. I love to hear. I'm also, you know, we sort of stealing some ideas. Um, so yeah, I think we're all committed to using our, our older kids as, as leaders. Great, thank you. Um, Karen and then Bronwyn. Um, thank you all so much. It's always nice to um, hear specific examples and, you know, hear the great things that are going on in the schools. So um, one of my questions is very similar to the question that I asked at the middle school. So it sounds like individually there's amazing things going on. What is your practice of getting best practices within each grade, within each school, sharing it within the school, and then sharing it among the schools? Do you have a formal way to kind of share best practices? I think it, it starts initially with the leadership. Um, and so the three of us are meeting weekly and, and talking about our themes for the month, the practices that we're doing, trends that we're noticing um, in, our, in different areas of our school. And so there's a lot of common planning time that, that the three of us spend. And then that trickles down um, to our, le our, our own leadership teams, our own climate teams. And then you know, that gets disseminated um, throughout, throughout our classrooms. Common PD. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's a, sort of my initial, mm -hmm. that's my initial thought. I think too, we all have very scripted and specific lessons within our programs, um, and then we've kind of individualized those lessons to our school. And <coughs> for example, at my school, we have a CARES document and activities that you could do that month, and you can click on a link really quick. So it's very easy for teachers to pull up rather than going to you know a textbook that might be on their shelf. Um, and, you know, just as recently as this school year, I don't remember which, who asked, but um, what are you doing to teach self-awareness? Mm -hmm. And so I just went right to that document, I copied and pasted the, the five activities that we had that were first, and it's just an easy way that Donna and Amy can then look and say, oh, this one's really cool, I'm going to share this with my staff at a faculty meeting, or I'm going to model this for my staff at a faculty meeting, and that's how we might begin a faculty meeting, so that we're actually engaged in the activity that the students are then going to be engaged in during morning meeting or um, any other component of their day. So we reach out to one another all the time as resources. 
Um, I think our grade level counterparts all work very closely with their other grade level um, colleagues across the district and get ideas from them as well. Um, so, so they I have like specific times when they can get together as like <coughs> all the third grades within the district? So or? we do have some of that dedicated time on um, professional development days. Mm -hmm. It's That's always still a struggle. It's going to be part of our SIP this year to try to our school improvement plan to get more of that time even with the middle school. Mm -hmm. um, that's We're really missing that time. It's not carved out as much as it is elementary um, from classroom to classroom um, horizontally. We're challenged vertically with the middle school right now. Mm -hmm. so. Uh, thank you all for coming uh, and preparing uh, a great report and presenting it to us. Really appreciate it. Uh, you guys were great, but the video was my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> Looking forward to watching the rest of that. Um, I guess I said one question. If someone could maybe describe um, the difference between either the classroom culture, I guess, and or school culture, kind of pre-castle and then now that council is being implemented in all the schools. So I wasn't at Wolf Swamp before Castle was implemented. The um, principal Guile, who was at Wolf Swamp the year prior to me coming in, um, had really, um, with our staff, embedded CARES as part of our approach to meeting the Castle competencies. Mm -hmm. So when I showed up at Wolf Swamp my very first year, it was like, here you go, everything's ready for you. So I was very fortunate in that regard. Um, I think if, yeah, I think I think that there is the the huge change that I've seen in the short time I've been in the, the district is the coming together of everybody. I mean, it was it was really important within the classroom that children learned all of these competencies, and there's no doubt that that was beginning to change things. But it was when that we took them those those lessons they were learning in the classroom where they where they should begin outside of the classroom and then into the community and further and beyond <coughs> that took time and i think at the same time that we were doing it leadership took over and just made it even bigger and so it's been it's just been blossoming um and i feel like it's not going to stop right it's a constant now so it's really just coming together as a whole from where we were um, just not quite there years ago, I think, mm -hmm. if that answers your question. Yeah, and, I, and I think pre, I think it's much more intentional teaching. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think at the elementary level, it lends itself to having very caring, loving, nurturing <laughs> teachers, and it's part of what they do on a daily basis, but, but with the SEL programs in place, it really is very intentional and much more visible, if that makes yes. sense. You know, it was always there, but now it, it just, it looks very different, and it feels different. And I agree with, with the cohesion. You know, everyone is using the same language. You're, you're, do, you're much more planful I think with what you're doing. super helpful, people are using common language. <coughs> yeah, like yes. teacher or yes. student <coughs> yes. or transfer schools. Yeah. Uh, that it's kind of like they fit right in, like, oh, it sounds just like, you know, it kind of makes me feel more at home. Which is really nice. The common language, I think, has been one of the biggest things I've seen that's changed everything, is that conversations and, and um, understandings of behavioral expectations, learning expectations, are all, we all are using a common language. So class to class, grade to grade, um, we all have an understanding of what certain phrases mean, phrases that are not pejorative, phrases that describe behavior as expected or unexpected. Um, so there's not a judgment attached to them, but it really helps um, children understand what is expected of them in all sorts of settings. And for many, many years, I think one of our biggest challenges was coming up with a common language that would follow students and all of us, colleagues, grade to grade to grade and as a school culture. And that took many, many years to identify and evolve. Um, it's very well embedded now, and I think we all feel it, and kids just understand things really well. Right, and I just would love to add an example of how it's affected us as a community, as a, as a group of colleagues who work together, how it felt for me when I first began, and knowing that I had to get to know my colleagues, but uh, last year when we had the flood at Wolf Swamp, um, my classroom was next to the classroom that was demolished, and um, it was really thrown into a heap. It was a mess. I had six teachers from center school come and put my classroom back together, and I teach at Wolf Swamp. 
So just to give you an idea, willingly, not asked, they came and helped me. And I had the math specialist go in my math closet and just fix it up for me. I had my teachers take my anchor charts and redo them for me, put them back on the wall. So just to give you an idea of the community that we created amongst ourselves, to me that is modeling <coughs> for the student what we are supposed to be like. We're not a competitive environment, we're an environment that is working together to teach what they should learn. I just thought it was worth sharing. Can I add to that answer too? And, and, and sure. I think, um, you know, Karen Palazzi has been tending to the social emotional needs of kids <laughs> for 40 years, right? I mean, this is not, in, in many respects, it's not new, but I, you asked what's changed. I think it, at our level, maybe what's changed is is the intentional part as well in terms of staffing decisions, budgeting, budgeting decisions, professional development planning decisions, um, school improvement and district improvement planning decisions. All those things um, hopefully are supporting the work that's happening at the classroom level. So I think it, the, the the word Donna used I think is is a is a key one. It's been very intentional. So that's great. Thank you. And then Melanie. Yeah. Okay. If you would. Yeah. Um, so that's something that you had mentioned was that although you have different um, methods or what do you call them methods, same framework, consistent, um, and it, it shows. It absolutely shows. So is it just a personal preference that you one might do the um, um, the cares or the peace builders? Was it just personal choice, or you had mentioned that? It, that's such a great question, mm -hmm. right? And, and I, that question has come up so much, and because I've been here longest, I, I guess what happened is that um, schools were at a different place at a different time. So, I mean, I'll speak to center. So we were at a place where we, most of our teachers were responsive classroom trained. And then the anti-bullying um, came about, and, and again, that was on our radar. And the teachers started feeling that they needed something more explicit more child-friendly, kid-friendly language that would complement the responsive classroom. And then we did our research, we got a committee together, we did our research and we found the Peace Builders and it spoke to our needs at that time. Right. And then I could say the same thing for Blueberry. They were at a different place, needed something different for their community, Wolf Swamp the same, and yet we all had the same focus but the communities were unique to what they were looking for and needed at particular times. Looking back, would we do it differently? Like, maybe, maybe we would have all come together. And but right now, it's it's the programs we have and the work we've put into it. I said it. It's like the character of our communities. It's our identity. It's become like who we are. You know, when we say we're using cares or you know when Amy said, what does it mean to be a blueberry? And they're doing the second steps in a peace builder. It's, it's, so we're really careful and thoughtful about making sure that we are addressing all of the social competencies and we have work to do. It's not perfect. We know we have work to do and we have to grow in that area. I think it's an ongoing process. And um, we want to make sure that when our students go off to middle school, they're going with the same social competencies and they're where they need to be when they hit middle school. So I don't know if that helps, oh, yeah. but no, I guess it's just the context. It's the context of where the schools were mm -hmm. at particular mm -hmm. at particular times. Time. Yeah, and it's clear that each of you have your own identity and it is yeah. very special and unique when we talk about yeah. these builders. I, I was just gonna say, just because I haven't been there a long time. <laughs> um, I think, well, it was, it was different administration, so that's changed yes. over the years. Mm -hmm. Plus, there wasn't as huge a focus. I mean, it's always been in kindergarten and, and elementary, it's always been a focus. But just because of the world we live in and everything else, and because it's become more a part of our curriculum that needs to be explicitly taught, um, I think, like you said, we were we were looking at it at different times too. So we were doing it not because it was mandated or it was part of the goals. It was just something we needed to do. Yeah. So people looked at it at different times and went to different resources and. Yeah, and it, it looks like you're sharing some of the best that each of you have to offer, and you are communicating the question that you know Karen had asked. Um, but I, I have one other question. Um, one of your measurement tools was number of referrals to the office, so that got me thinking a little bit. Would it be advantageous or worthwhile? I know it'd be a little bit of extra work on the teachers' parts, but in terms of um, having measurable data to almost keep like almost a checklist of. You know, when your your kids come to you and they have something great to report, or they have something 
that you want to work on. So someone comes and says, oh, he called me a name. Kind of a checklist. Well, even if it's just a check um, of that behavior that you're trying to improve versus, you know, if the child comes to you and says, so-and-so just helped me, you know, she told me I toilet paper stuck in my shoe or whatever. <laughs> Something that was, or, you know, being a big helper or whatever. Um, and then you put that in that, that column. And then so at the end of the month, you've got a tally, you've got some data to, to send to the office and, and look over the course of a year. Yeah, we have an office referral. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's a, a, a positive mm -hmm. piece referral. You know, if, if the student is coming from positive reason, also an office referral. If a student is sent to the office for something that they should be sent to the office for, and it's checked off, and I keep a record of the office referrals, and those referrals go home for a parent's signature. So that's the data collection that we do for the, mm -hmm. and, and the teachers, I guess, I, I, I would defer to you about, you know, are you talking like classroom-based as well yeah, as Yeah, classroom-based. Like how, how many times during the day did something good happen with one of your students? So you can actually measure and, and watch at the end of a month, we had, you know, 30 pot, or you tally them all up, fifth grade had 125 great things and 50 mm -hmm bad, you know, for lack of a better word. And then at the end of the year, you say, hey, you know, we've gone down on a monthly basis. Our, our goods are going up and our bands are going down. And just to measure progress, if it would be worth it or not. And we all, I think the three of us have ways that we acknowledge those positive behaviors. It's, it's for, for me, I think I can speak for the three of us. It's a struggle with, you know, making sure that the feedback is authentic versus are we just giving a wow ticket, we call them wow tickets. Um, you know, are we just giving it because we, we need to meet our quota or is it, wow, I really noticed that you did a great job grappling with that program or that problem, I'm going to give you a wow ticket. So that's something that we, that we struggle with and I think, you know, maybe this previous school that I was at, we needed to do that because we had a different, a different clientele and so there was a different need for different acknowledgement systems. With the office discipline referral form, um, it specifies location, it specifies time of day. So we are also able to look at, um, you know, where was it happening, who, how many kids were involved, is it a repeat offender, those kinds of things. So we're able to, with our own forms, track that data as well. Maybe it's all, all the behaviors coming from Mrs. Hansen's <coughs> class. So now I need to go and, you know, address that specifically with, you know, maybe but there's some management yeah. technique. But it also <laughs> helps with that tiered intervention mm -hmm. for social emotion. If you have sure. a student who's yeah. been sent to you two or three times, yeah. you know, and it's an office referral, you know that they're going to need that need that next level of intervention. I guess I was just looking at it in, from the kids' eyes. Yeah. What, are, what behaviors are the kids showing that they're hearing what you're saying? I think what I go back um, to is what in, Michelle in shared when she talked about um, Shelly Pantusco having the kindness wall in her classroom, and you're talking about the, the praising, the praising pass, the pass praising something P's alliteration. <laughs> um, <laughs> and you know, in my thank you. In my school, I know that teachers do many different things. Somehow, you know, you put a jewel in the jar every time, and once the jar gets full, the kid, the class gets a reward. So they're each classroom, depending on um, who they have in front of them that school year, has their own way of doing it. You also have classrooms that started doing it one way because it worked last year, and then you have a totally different clientele in your classroom this year. And maybe the the kindness wall is effective, but you need to do a little bit more. There ha it has to be more explicitly or direct um, because some students maybe aren't getting that feedback. So I think we're constantly adjusting based on our classroom makeup from year to year. I don't know if that helps, but I do think that we keep um, you know, informal data of the expected behaviors that we're seeing. Um, and as you said, the wow tickets, the, the positive praise um, at my school, teachers will tell me or substitutes will leave notes like that this person was really helpful and I write postcards to the kids. Um, so that they're getting that positive reinforcement. They love those. I'm just going to go out on a limb and say um, that I don't think each classroom teacher would want a checklist, mm. something else. That, and I'm not saying they don't keep track of it, but <clears throat> that specific, but <clears throat> something that goes along with the jewel in the jar or the marshmallow in the whatever. Um, <laughs> my kids see it. I have a, I called it a happy face jar in the past. Now it's peace tokens. Um, at the beginning of the year, it was all happy, 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 happy to get everybody, you know, buying in, self-confidence. But I do have um, little sad faces every once in a while. It's not individualized, but it's, oh, well, we were really noisy in the hallway. We really need to work on that. Sad face goes in the jar. So my kids, so I, I can monitor it each day. I know, did we have a lot of sad faces today? 
or and at the end of the day I shake it up and I pick one out and usually it's a happy and we have our little way of celebrating um, so visually for my kids they they kind of get to see did we work really hard today and you know follow our peace builder rules or did we have some things we had to work on to practice um, so I mean that's a visual for the kids and it's a visual for me um, and you're that, able to, you pass that on in terms of when you're meeting with oh I've seen you know, this is getting better, there's less of this. Right. I guess oh. I, I'm just looking at like... Yeah, it's a, visual, it's a visual for me, and it's a visual for the kids. I mean, that's, you know, at my level. Um, so it, you know, in the fifth grade, I mean, it's a constant effort to make sure that, you know, not an effort, it's, it's something I make sure I do every day. Whatever I notice that's positive, it's said. In front of the whole group, individually, wherever we are, it's said. So those, this is helping them to bring self-awareness to themselves, too. I made a good choice today. If we didn't make a good choice, we gather around and we talk about it, whether it's one-on-one, -on -one, small group. What could we have done better? We work together. I learned that through the teachings of Ross Screen. Tr what was the trigger that made them make that choice? Was it because they didn't want to do that math test? Is it typically happening in that t at that time, the bad choices that are being made, and, and helping them to realize that it as well? So it's constantly visiting it verbally at, at the higher grade level and expecting it to come and thinking about it. It brings back that self-awareness and self-management piece. Um, but the data, the point that you make about the data, supposing we're walking in line, I see some good choices being made. Somebody, they, they did a great job all the way up. Certain students I would have necessarily not expected it all the time. I get to praise them that day for it. Something interrupts me on the way. I have a class waiting for me as soon as I walk up. When do I find the time to it? Right, that one of 50 compliments I made that day. And you can bet I spent time making 50 compliments. So it's just the authenticity that you mentioned, Amy, I think is key to measure that data might be difficult. One thing that um, a lot of elementary school teachers have been using, um, in our school we've got uh, about seven or eight teachers now using something called Class Dojo. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and it's a great online platform. And um, there's so much to it, but the components specifically speaking to your checklist idea, uh, what's nice is um, the first few weeks of school will identify what are the behaviors we, as a class, value, what are the things we, we want to make sure to make sure our classrooms run running smoothly. So it could be things like, you know, um, being a good listener, um, being being specifically kind, um, or you can get really nitty gritty, you know, walking quietly in the hall, that was a real uh, challenge for our class in the beginning of the year. Um, but I have my computer and I'll, I'll walk around with, with the computer um, as they're transitioning to gym. and. Uh, and the kids will know, you know, I'm really paying attention to that piece, and I can, um, and all teachers that have been doing it, it's kind of nice. You have a very instant feedback. Uh, the kids hear a ping. It's kind of Pavlovish, but uh, you hear a ping, and you know that's a positive sound. You know that they're showing that expected behavior. Maybe one student is, is is needs a little help getting back on track. You know, there's a different sound for that. Um, but at the end of the week, what, I'll, what I've started to do with the kids is track those behaviors, and I can pull a student aside and say, gosh, you, you know, I've been noticing lately, you're having a real hard time uh, staying focused in class. You know, I, I see about six or seven times um, that this happened this week. You know, what are we gonna do to get back on track yeah. for next week? We have a goal chart uh, related to that. Um, the nice thing is there's some incident feedback also with families, um, yeah. and so families can see that. It goes immediately to, uh, to home email. Um, so it's it's helpful data, mm -hmm. um, just one to, uh, one piece. That, um, it's been helpful in our, mm -hmm. in our classroom and, and a few of the other uh, classrooms that's, that's been using it. So yeah, yeah. Like that. I mean, measuring data is always the tough part. I mean, measure a lot of these things, but keep up the good work because then they won't have to do work half as hard in high school. <laughs> 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 Anyone else have a? <clears throat> I'll just close with. Um, my thank you, first of all, for coming, for assembling a team, giving a presentation that really for us is so important as a committee because we oftentimes don't know what is happening in the classroom. So from the high school down to the middle school to now your team presenting, I think it's so helpful for us because it gives us that useful picture of how is this actually being implemented, where are they struggling with some components of it, how are they sharing it? How are we monitoring it? Do we know that it's successful? And you've each given a nice representation of that. I think every group comes with the start of how much SEL is supported in the district. And I just, I wanna emphasize to all of you, and I, I maybe didn't do this enough with middle and high school, that 
we really, as a school committee, are truly partnering with you on this. Um, we will vote our goals later tonight, but I just wanted to tell you like how important it is to school committee, SEL. It's goal number one for us this year. Not that any one goal takes more priority or, over another, but to engage all stakeholders to sustain the district's commitment to academic excellence and promote the well-being of all students with attention to physical, social, and emotional health. And obviously we have some objectives underneath that about how we would um, you know, like to see that achieved. But I think for a committee, for us, we're in a spot where we want to use what we have at our, our disposal, I guess, and how do we support you in the budget and how do we support you um, in policy are two of the main ways that we can do that. So to hear you tonight, um, you know, it just for me sends the signal that, you know, maybe PD is a way budgetarily that we can start supporting more of this because we have to find ways where we can make sure that you are supported in the work that you're doing. Um, it's important to us, it's important to the district, it's important to all of you. Um, I'm not going to single everybody out because you all did, a, you know, a nice job of presenting, but I will say just to close, Michelle, I love that you brought the books because that's a way where I see kids are identifying with their emotion tied into a reading and writing exercise. But I also love that it's now in the library because that means that's not just owned by that one child. If there's somebody else that's saying, oh my gosh, I have, I, I'm like this too. You know, it's, I'm not alone in my feeling, right? So thank you for bringing that. Kelly, when we talk about um, teachers like embedding this and it becoming like you speak it, like you walk the walk and you talk the talk, Thank I can you. tell it. Um, so when we talk about teachers um, really like supporting colleagues and, and um, doing some type of PD, um, I feel like you're a good candidate for that because you. You, you've embraced this. But I loved particularly how you talked about it's not just that you're changing the child, the child has changed you and we're all um, in it together so thank you all I, I've done so much work in your classroom with the peace jar I'm so familiar with that I, I know exactly what's happening over there so I won't comment specifically but um, great job thank you for coming um, please always be in touch with us in terms of anything that we can do as a committee to support I look forward to the video and, and watching the whole thing and, and making the kids the stars so thanks thank you thank you, thank you. And thank you for coming and, and, and enjoying our new setup because I really do, again, with the third group, I felt like it does extend our night. It extends the conversation, but it's so much more of a back and forth. Yeah. And I feel like we're asking the questions and then you'll respond, but then your colleagues chime in. I, I'm really That's great. pleased with how it's the wonderful. presentations are going and I hope you felt the same way. Have a great night. Thank thank you. You. I did, you know where to find you. <laughs> so we will move on in our agenda as we're bringing our group back to the table. We'll have um, Reggie rejoin and Diane and Tom and Sue, but then we can move right into our administrative reports and we'll start off with the superintendent's report. Sure. Uh, most important thing I can report tonight is that there's no score. In the Red Sox, apparently. Uh -oh. uh, zero, zero, okay. bottom of the first. I know Mr. Maz is yes, probably. Yes. I don't know why. I want to know how you know. <laughs> probably, probably telling you. Or? Uh, no, uh, so I, I, I offered some thoughts on the uh, on the Japanese cultural exchange. It's in your report. Uh, we, we, heard from, we heard earlier. Um, appreciate the committee's interest in that cultural exchange. I think it's the first time mm -hmm. we brought the, the group, uh, in recent memory anyways, to the committee. And so it's great to showcase uh, that cultural exchange. Uh, Leaf Gala, uh, November 3rd, 6.30. Um, Twin Hills Country Club. I want to mention that we had an opportunity recently to meet with representatives from Longmeadow Police and Fire, uh, specifically on reunification planning, and so reunification as an important component of emergency preparedness. Um, we feel like this is sort of a, a new and important direction for us in terms of uh, keeping all students and staff safe. 
And so uh, we'll, we'll be working at some point in the future on some tabletop exercises to sort of drill and practice those reunification plans that are currently being developed uh, with by our principals. Uh, tax ceiling task force, I think that's on your agenda uh, later on, so we, uh, uh, we can uh, share our thoughts later there. Uh, community conversations, this is the, uh, the conversation series that um, I launched uh, recently and we started at the Longmeadow Adult Center. I want to thank um, Mr. Ray, uh, Ms. Rothstein, uh, and Ms. Monahan for joining me at the Adult Center. Uh, we had a nice chat with some of the seniors there and uh, they, they offered their thoughts and feedback. They were especially like us. They were concerned about the overall wellness of kids. Um, they, they were more interested in, in that, really, than they were uh, some of the academic um, issues that we talked about. So that was interesting. Uh, Thursday morning, I will be hosting here in the central office a the next installment of that community conversation. And it's a um, parents have registered. Uh, Diane, thank you for managing the registration on that. And that's. Uh, the first focus is on childhood stress and anxiety. So that's Thursday morning. We'll have a sort of a repeat conversation on Thursday evening. Plug for the Special Programs Committee, Rick Wormelli, a nationally known educational consultant. He will be talking to parents on the evening of November 13th, <coughs> 7 o'clock in the LHS Auditorium. He's also going to be um, presenting to our teachers uh, on that professional development day. So we're excited to have sort of one single community conversation again uh, on some of the topics that Mr. Wormelli will bring to us. Differentiation, homework, standards-based grading, um, depending on the audience of teachers that he is talking to. Uh, high school start time uh, task force met Wednesday, October 10th. We have another meeting mid-October, I think it's the 15th of November, and we have developed an action plan that will hopefully kind of push the work forward, the study that that group is, is undergoing. Um, and then finally, wanted to mention again that um, an opportunity to join the Western Massachusetts Homeland Security Council. I want to thank Chief John Dearborn from the Fire Department for uh, inviting me to join this really important council. It's a council that uh, essentially is responsible for managing uh, the state's homeland security grant. So it's really well financed, really well organized, and I think it'll help us keep our ear to the ground on some of the latest safety initiatives that are happening across the state, across the country. So. Um, um, I'm anxious to continue my work with that council. So, <coughs> so that's it. Uh, questions? Happy to answer. Um, otherwise, that's it. No questions or comments. Okay. Thank you for reporting on yeah. that. And uh, we will move on to our student representative report. Reggie, you can take it from here. Yes. Um, we got a few more, uh, a few thoughtful suggestions the past few weeks, which is not something we're used to. <laughs> Um, one person uh, suggested that transfer students, when they come in, that they be paired up with a peer leader. That way they could get like more comfortable with the school. And um, uh, so I like that idea a lot. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to talk to Mrs. Warren about that one. Um, another student suggested that we have uh, every student have a mandatory meeting with one of the school's social workers. Uh, I'm not so sure about that one, but I'll like, we have a meeting on Friday with like all like the school like representatives so I'll bring that one up there. Um, uh, we had college fair Monday for juniors and seniors so that's where uh, a bunch of representatives from colleges come up in the cafeteria and um, we get some time to like look around and like talk to them. Um, there's a concert tomorrow and uh, oh, just a comment I had on the Improbable Players Day. I thought um, Mr. Lander's speech at the like end of it all on like sexual harassment and like um, Miss Roy, did, like a whole thing on consent. And I think those were like the I got the most out of that part of the day, and 
I think that's like something that's not talked about to like the that's never talked about like in front of like the whole grade. So I thought that was uh, cool to see. Thank you. Anyone have any comments or questions? I do. Yeah. Thank Hi. you for that college thing. I got a, a gift from my junior about 15 to 20 uh, colleges that we can now go visit. Thanks for that. <laughs> 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 then it did its job, yeah. yeah. They're not cheap. We only brought in the expensive ones for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyone else? Thank you, Reggie. I think you always bring us some really great and insightful things that um, you guys really have your ear to the ground. I, I do have one question. I've been hearing, with, has there been any discussion amongst the high school students about um, the football games? And I, I feel like last week the game got changed to an earlier time. Like, how yeah, is no, that? Yeah, no, people didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know sophomore year, um, they did that because of lock-in, right? Because they thought, um, People wouldn't like sophomores wouldn't go because of lock in, but the lock in starts at ten. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, so that's why like like my sophomore year we had it like at seven and like everybody showed up, so it's fine. Yeah, I was just wondering if you had any feedback yeah. or well, yeah, all I know is that people were complaining. Yeah, there was yeah, I I think it's something we need to chat about. Um, I, I think there was also the issue of the the supervision. And the need for administrators at a at a night football game, followed by their commitment throughout the night to the to the sophomore lock-in. So um, I think the game was originally scheduled for Saturday, and then they moved it to Friday. But um, we can chat more about that. Sure, sure. Yeah. It's good to know that you're getting lots of nice, thoughtful feedback, and, and no proposals yet in your suggestion box. <laughs> so thank you for sharing that. Uh, we can move on to our other reports, LPVEC. Yes, corporation. I can speak to that first. I have my notes. Um, I don't know uh, we talked about the balance sheet, which at the moment the corporation has a little over two million dollars. And according to the conversation, that's normal. It's because the uh, money needs to be there to pay the bills before the bills get sent to the district. So right now, that's in the normal state. And we talked about giving a bid award for the machine technology program expansion project. To RAC builders of Agwan, they were the lowest bidder. Mm. Pretty brief meeting. <laughs> then Brad went. Yes, it wasn't that brief because it ran into our meeting, which actually was uh, super brief. Um, we passed a couple motions and um, went extremely quickly. Um, the only thing is, next month the meeting is the same night as a school committee meeting, and they're going to be looking to. Um, have some voting on some stuff. So I told them that as of right now, I was planning on going to the school committee meeting, but if they needed me, um, if they didn't have a quorum, um, because someone has to come in to uh, take the vote. So if they didn't have a quorum, um, they could let me know, and perhaps I could <coughs> do that first, and then come to the school committee meeting. So I'll keep you posted. Um, Paula said she would let me know if um, the, you know, they didn't have a quorum, and then I could maybe go there first and then come here. Is that on the November 14th yes. night meeting? Okay. Yes. Yeah. All right. Good Thanks. to know. And SEAL, do we have any report? Nothing. Uh, food service? No. Go ahead. We did meet. Uh, we met today, as a matter of fact, our first meeting. Um, we got an update on the transition from food uh, cafe services. Um, then the start of the school year, uh, staffing update. A majority of staff have been retained. Most of the leads have been uh, <coughs> returning who we were here last year, so it helped with uh, continuity of service. Uh, we had some, some feedback in terms of some ideas relating to marketing of the program, both uh, to students and to families about what's going on. And uh, we also looked at some participation data. <coughs> Our next meeting is scheduled for early December, where we will be going to the high school and having lunch um, to sample what they're serving and see if it kind of lines up to what our expectations and hopes are for the program, which we intend to do at all three levels throughout the course of the year. We also suggested maybe ways that they could get some feedback from students. Uh, we recommended that they contact Mr. Dunkley to get um, on the agenda for the Student Advisory Council 
to come um, and meet with them and just kind of hear some ideas and maybe some feedback from the students regarding the program at the high school. Sounds good. Anything yeah, to add? Yeah, I'll just add, um, and also looking at kind of brainstorming ways to to market this new vendor that we have who have a lot of just, I think it's a really exciting meal choices and options. So I think now that they're a little settled, they'll move into a little more marketing and making parents who might not even be aware that there's a new vendor and, and new options, um, you know, making that known to them. That's, That's good. I know I'm in central office a lot and I see the employees coming out with their uniforms on and I I comment on that. They, they look nice. It's, it's nice to see the employees in the, in the uniform coming from work. So thank you for that and we can move on to Mr. Mazza and the finance subcommittee report. Yeah, we don't really have anything to report out tonight. We did meet um, yesterday, as a matter of fact. We have a number of items that will be appearing on future agendas. Right? Did we want to talk about the turkey trap? It's not going to be, I think, on the 29th. Okay. Um, do we want to talk about the motion we made to recommend to the school committee the approval um, of the full time for the length? I think we were going to do that on the 29th, unless you want to take it up tonight. It wasn't in the packet and it wasn't on tonight's agenda. Okay. That's what I was wondering because the. We Building request for now. About yeah. the, 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 yeah. We can wait. Discuss that. Because we'll want that info. Yes, you'll want it. Discuss whether or not you want to discuss it on the 29th. Is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah we I mean, I think it's, yeah. run into a little bit of hurdle with the 29th. Um, when we met, la we just met last night for finance sub, and we did propose that we would bring some motions and do a mini meeting before the 29th, but the 29th is technically not a school committee meeting it's a joint meeting with the select board and when I got home I realized we really only have a quorum for that select board joint meeting there's only four out of the seven of us attending that night on the 29th so I didn't feel like we should bring motions um, to just four out of the seven even though that's technically a, a quorum um, I don't think it's a good idea to vote on the motions before the budget meeting when only four of us are pre present so we were thinking we would push that back a little bit and do it before our um, norms and protocols workshop on the 14th, sure. if that makes sense. Sure. Yeah, I didn't realize when we were talking about that meeting that we really only have four of us there that night. <coughs> we, um, do those building, we had a bunch of the building requests we do then too. Right. Um, unless we need to do the... The only one was turkey. for November, the turkey trial. The rest are in May and June, so they don't yeah. matter as okay. much. So that one will still fit within the. It's not on the agenda, so I'm not sure we can take it yeah. up. Yeah, I don't think we can. There'll be there'll be enough time on the turkey trot to okay. get they it. Get a really big hint that it's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty feel, likely. Feel <laughs> yeah. We'll lace, say it's not on the agenda. Up their <laughs> <laughs> um, so if that's it for finance, we can just move on to policy sub. Okay, so policy sub met um, on Friday. Um, and just in the essence of time, we, you know, we made some policy decisions, but they won't be up on the website yet because of the, we didn't have them posted um, for the 48-hour notice to, uh, to present them tonight. Um, but we, um, we settled up some old business with uh, policy BEDG, which is in um, minutes and the note, note to minutes that MASC had put on their policy. Um, so. We did get clarification of that from uh, our attorney. Um, and the summary of it is that it's pretty much what we've been doing, that our notes should just be a gist of what is going on and not a narrative. Um, so we are just going to leave, leave that off of, of the policy, um, and use the policy that we currently have, but we are going to be adding an additional paragraph that was suggested to us by the state in terms of the timeliness of getting the minutes to you all and voting on them. So we'll be adding that, but we'll bring it to you um, in our next meeting. For the first reading and um, the other policy, KEE, -E, it was found to be really obsolete and not not um, used anymore, so we will be voting that out, but we'll be presenting that also for the first reading. Um, at our next meeting, um, new business, uh, we met with the high school principal, athletic director, and assistant superintendent of finance 
to discuss ways to reduce stress and anxiety um, of athletes and to kind of better balance the weight of academics with the um, you know, responsibilities of, of athletics, basically. So more specifically, uh, one of the issues that we discussed at great length was the amount of time associated with travel to away games, in particular for um, varsity teams who might be gone for six or seven hours um, in, a, in a given day and could have several games a week or that could possibly happen a couple times a week. And just trying to look at what our options might be so we had input you know, from Tom in terms of the financial implications that would involve either using a second bus um, where JV and varsity would split up their, their traveling. In other words, everyone leaves at 2.30 where JV, or uh, this is an example of course, might leave at 2.30 or 2.45 to head to Northampton where JV might have a four o'clock or five o'clock game and varsity is not playing till seven finishing close to 9, driving home, 9.30, getting home at 10, having to eat and shower, and therefore, you know, being away for, for six or seven hours for an away game. Um, and so, uh, again, some of the things that we discussed is having a bus, have, you know, putting a second bus on to take varsity a little bit later, you know, to have them leave at 5 o'clock or you know, 5.30 for a 7 o'clock game. Um, or in school districts that are closer, you know, in East Long Meadow, Agawam, you know, something under a five, six mile radius, maybe having the bus loop back around because, you know, there are differences in what we pay for a bus and in terms of it gets there at 3.15 and then it sits, we pay one rate to, to sit there until everyone's done and comes back home. So we need to look at, okay, they leave at 2.45 with JV, but they come back since it's just a few miles away, come back. And they take, you know, the, the varsity students a little later, bring JV back, and then come back and get varsity. So, I mean, there's no, you know, perfect solution, but, you know, we are looking at, you know, all of those options. Um, you know, we discussed, you know, whether or not we want to, you know, involve parents. Uh, you know, in addressing this, we looked at our school policy, which basically states that when a bus is available, the students are required to take a bus. However, we found that that wasn't always working in the case of JP, where oftentimes they were leaving after their game and going home with parents. So it's kind of like we have policy that might um, encourage one thing and, and behavior not necessarily being um, congruent. So we have to, you know, we have to look at that um, a little more in depth. Um, so in the end, we decided that uh, we would kind of do a, a trial, like a three-game trial in um, over the winter. Of I think just basketball is affected at that point, where these creative minds will um, pick a couple of two or three games where we might be able to see how it would work, either doing a, a looping back and forth with a, a game at a shorter distance, um, or providing a second bus for when you have these longer, um, you know, games up in Pittsfield or Amherst or in Northampton and Belchertown and, and so forth. Um, so we're going to do a little trial and see what it how it affects the money, see what this, you know, the student impact is, see if there are any other consequences that, you know, we weren't expecting or um, new information uh, to look at with that. Um, I'm just uh, looking over my, the rest of my notes here. Um, just something of note that we pointed out that Ludlow has um, instituted what they call um, a family Family Reconnect weekend and vacations where they've set aside three um, weekends out of the year so it coincide with each of the fall, um, winter, and spring kind of sports season, so to speak. So um, where they are going to have a very, you know, minimal reduced to no homework or, um, you know, homework expect expectations over that two or three day time period and also reduced athletics in terms of like practices. And um, you know the purposes allow families time time to be together, time to you know take a few days and get away or whatever whatever it is that your interest is. But their dates are November 11th through 13th, which would coincide around the um, Veterans Day holiday. So it almost would even get a little longer stretch. January 19th through 21, which is also a holiday weekend, and March 23 to 25. 
So I think, you know, they recognize the importance of kind of giving kids maybe a two days to dis disengage. You know, right now we do have a six, um, you know, policy that only allows you to practice or play for six days out of seven. But, you know, sometimes every now and then, every few months, it's nice to get two days off so families can just uh, totally dis disconnect us, you know, my opinion. But we're, we're discussing this, which is good. And we had a great discussion. Uh, I think everyone uh, recognizes you know, the burden that this can place on, on the, the student athletes. And um, everyone was having a good discussion on, on, on seeing what we could do to improve that. And I think that that's it. Any questions? Any questions or comments? Yeah. Arma? Yeah, <laughs> I guess a couple. Um, you know, the, the one thing I didn't hear mentioned, and I just would throw it out as a suggestion, especially in the fall season, um, you know, for soccer or for football, or whatever else, most high schools around the area have multiple fields just have the athletic director schedule both games at the same exact time one bus and you save the cost on that second thing is I don't know why I mean maybe it's just because I've just come in recently but I don't know why we're focusing just on the athletics um, you know my daughter who's in the or, or was in orchestra and I know the kids in the orchestra sometimes they're having section leaders call them out from six o'clock till like 9 30 at night on a weeknight to practice for the concerts uh, other extracurriculars are facing the same thing. So if we're gonna do it from a policy perspective and we're talking about the stress on the balance between academics and extracurricular activities, I think the scope, just in my opinion, the scope should be brought in to include all extracurricular activities and what impact that has on the, the learning of the, the, the child or the, that those stress levels we're talking about. So that's just my, my opinion. No, yeah, I, I guess you can. I would let you answer that. Um, yeah, no, I guess we just have to see how much it is affect them. I'm not as familiar with extra extracurriculars, but if this is something that's routine or occurring, you know, the hours are starting to add up, the demands on the kids, of course, yeah. I mean, all the kids are feeling stress, and, and every activity I'm, I'm certain contributes to, you know, a certain level of stress. And in terms of um, having the games on the same field, we did, you know, we did discuss this situation, and it seems that they are not, whereas before they might have done them at the same time on two different fields, it sounds like because I did specifically, you know, question that, it seems like most of the schools, unbeknownst to me, were, were playing, um, you know, that, that was not happening. But it certainly is a, a, it certainly would help the situation if they did play on the same time, but sometimes they're using the same ref, um, so the refs just move over following one game and, and go to the other field. You know, you have a varsity field kind of versus, you know, the night games are played on a varsity stadium, whereas JV, they don't usually play on the varsity stadium. So, um, you know, that would, yeah, but they're definitely a, something to think about. Yes. Just to jump on that, um, I agree with you, Armand. I think we do need to make sure we include all the extracurriculars. And then on that other piece, there was a discussion about um, gate receipts, if I remember correctly, and that a lot of towns don't want to separate the gate or want to separate the games mm -hmm. because then they can collect twice for money. Certainly right? no and excuse, that, right? Yeah. <laughs> not an excuse, not at our kids' expense, you know. So, which is great. I think that we're having the discussion, and I would piggyback on that and say you're right. Valid point, Armand and Karen, that obviously all of the kids in extracurricular. I think maybe from policy perspective, athletics was a not the be-all and end-all of what we would change, but I think a starting point of saying maybe it was more of a concrete, like we've got you know the long bus trips, and that's a good place to start with with how we can um, alleviate some of that. I would be curious about the, just the Long Meadow School Committee's decision to do the family weekends. Was that something? Do you know that you it was it? Ludlow. I'm Ludlow. Did I say Long Meadow? Yeah, <laughs> I think you did. Wishful thinking. Back um, you guys. Was it um, something that was like, did it come from like within the district? Was it an initiative that the school committee had come forward? Like, I'm, I'm assuming they were all yeah, supportive think, and yeah. and willing to implement it, but I would be curious about yeah, that. Yeah, and that's some information background. I can find out. I know yeah. it was a school committee member who posted it and was just very excited about bringing that initiative. I don't know. If, I'm sure it was a joint effort, and, and obviously they're talking about the same things over there. Right, right. And that everyone. weekend free was from extracurriculars as well as athletics, so it wasn't specifically targeted. It was all extracurricular, so. 
I mean, mm -hmm. touch base with the administration and we'll, we'll find out. Yeah, I'd be curious yeah. to get some of the, yeah. the history on that. Yeah. Um, so thank you, Melanie, for all of that good information and those discussions that are happening. Um, evaluation subcommittee. Ryan, we didn't, we don't we didn't meet, <laughs> so we have nothing to report. <clears throat> and then, um, Marty, if you want to pick it up with the tax ceiling, the tax ceiling task force. Sure. Um, so, <clears throat> task ceiling task force, I have a hard time with that, <laughs> um, <laughs> has been meeting for several months to um, consider how Longmeadow might respond to the impending um, looming at some point down the road uh, where the tax rate would hit the, the $25 on a 1000 cap. And so the task force has looked at it from a number of different angles. They've talked about you know, potential cost containment strategies. They've talked about revenue enhancement strategies. And where the discussion went most recently was around um, legislative relief strategies and specifically uh, consideration of whether or not there ought to be some legislative solution to the $25 cap, which was established when Prop 2.5 came online back in the 80s. And so the thought on, among some members of the task force was that that's a sort of a, a, an arbitrary or at least maybe perhaps an antiquated uh, cap that, that ought to be reconsidered legislatively. And so that's, um, that's kind of an update of, of where that uh, where the work of that task force has been recently. And uh, Mr. Maz and I have been uh, attendees. It's a task force that includes representatives from Senator Lesser's office, Representative Ash's office. Uh, the select board has obviously represented the town manager. And then there's a, a handful of community members. And then our uh, collective bargaining groups, both on the town side and the school side, are represented on that task force. So. Um, some some good, constructive, rich discussions, but I, I thought it'd be worth the committee uh, kind of understanding where that group is right now. Any questions or comments on any of that? Okay, thank you for reporting in on that. Um, <coughs> just a quick little bit of ongoing business before we get to the MCAS report. Um, once Armand joined and filled the vacancy on our committee, I <coughs> went back and looked at our subcommittee assignments um, to see where he could play a, a role in, in filling some of our subcommittee work. So <coughs> in your packet, you have the revised and updated list of subcommittee assignments um, for this 2018-2019 year. Um, but I do have a possible motion on the agenda um, once we looked at how to balance that out um, I had asked Armand if he would be willing to serve on the tax ceiling task force. Um, so I'm going to fill your name in there. But the motion is um, to specifically nominate Armand. So if anyone would like to make that motion, we can get that um, done in permanent record. Oh, I know. oh go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I'll okay. second it. You can go okay. there. I nominate Armand Gray to serve on the tax ceiling task force. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? That we'll just call for a vote. All those in favor? Any opposed or abstaining? Are you opposing or abstaining? I'm abstaining. <laughs> I just feel weird <laughs> voting for myself. <laughs> um, so, yay, congratulations. You're on the tax ceiling task force. Um, and we'll look forward to, to your reports with, uh, with Marty in the future. Um, the other thing we need to vote on is once we finalize uh, our school committee goals, um, thank you all so much for working in two different separate works, workshop sessions to develop our goals and objectives, um, which we did successfully do on October 1st and 9th. So now we can um, go ahead and vote our goals, which are in your packet with the objectives. Um, and we have a motion on the table for that as well. I move that the school committee approve the 2018-2019 school committee goals as presented and dated October 23rd, 2018. Second. Any further discussion? If not, all those in favor? Any opposed or abstaining? So motion passes and our goals are voted on and done. Um, so new business now, we can move into our MCAS um, Achievement and Accountability Report and Marty and Sue will 
take over this part of the presentation. Let's see how it goes. So you got the laptop, right? Yep. Yeah, Reggie and I made a deal. Sorry, Marnie. Reggie's gonna pass my my pass out and he's gonna go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. So this is updated. So it's an updated version. Yeah. So this one don't look at this one. Don't look at that. So not the one that was in our package. No, oh, this is brand new. If you give me like, I'll tweak something in the last minute. So. We made it really yeah. small. So <laughs> Put your best glasses on. Tom's got an extra pair. Are you kidding me? Well, it, it's, <laughs> you'll see the slides up here on the screen. So, uh, <coughs> so we, um, we received um, <sighs> recently the, the 2018 MCAS uh, Accountability and Achievement Reports from the Department of Education. The individual student reports have made their way to uh, families, and so I, I, I would say I think Desi has done a nice job of providing, I don't know what your experiences <laughs> were as parents, but it seems to me that the parent reports are clear and understandable, hopefully helpful to our parents. And if anybody at home uh, has any questions about those individual reports, certainly let us know. But we're here tonight to talk more or less about uh, the, the district and school level results. And when we think about uh, our MCAS results, I think there's um, some guiding principles that uh, focus our work and help us respond appropriately to MCAS. For starters, I'd say that we try to focus on being very balanced um, in our response to MCAS. We recognize that MCAS is one data point we recognize that there are, as tonight's presentation suggested, that there's, there's really dozens of ways that we measure student growth and achievement. Uh, we're looking at their growth as, as children, as people. We're looking at their social emotional competency. We're looking at their interests um, in, in the arts and in athletics and in extracurriculars. But, Tonight, we're here to talk to you about MCAS. And so again, one, only one of many tools that we use to reflect on performance at the district, school, classroom, and individual student level. And I think it's important to remember that, those four different levels, uh, four different ways we can, we can look at it. One of the things we like to say to teachers is, you know, we, we don't want to be, uh, you know, a test prep school district. We don't want our teachers to engage in drill and kill rote instruction just so that kids can achieve on the MCAS exam. I mean, let's face it, you know, there, there probably are ways that we can drill and kill on MCAS and achieve greater results, but our focus has always been on instructional practice and on the standards. And we feel like if we're dialed in to the standards and if we pay attention to good pedagogy, that the results will take care of themselves. That's not to say that we don't want kids to be familiar with the MCAS exam. You know, if there are opportunities to incorporate or introduce MCAS-like questions in the course of good instruction, we'll do that. But it's not going to be um, sort of MCAS, MCAS prep for the sake of MCAS results. Focus on the standards, focus on instructional practice. And then focusing on understanding, and I, and I really think it's important for the committee to recognize this, that, that the results that we get in MCAS, that they go quickly to RTI teams and child study teams at, our, at all levels, so that we're understanding the individual growth and achievement of individual students. And to underscore the point that we are engaged in uh, instruction and, and, and we use many, many different indicators of student success and achievement. Just kind of click through some of the different ways that some of the different indicators, assessments, 
tools that we use to measure student growth and achievement. And frankly, this isn't everything. This is just a, a sampling of some of the indicators that we're looking at, that we're always looking at. Again, at the, at the district, school, classroom, individual student level. And make a, we, did, we're, we don't have um, SAT results for you tonight. I mean, they're not really part of this presentation, the MCAS presentation. But I will say, uh, many of you have seen in, in uh, the reports, the, the local paper came out with a, a ranking of districts on SAT results. And Longmeadow was 29th in the state, which is quite an achievement. And we're especially proud that, um, with the exception of one small charter school, we're the highest ranking district on SATs, I think west of Worcester. So there's a lot to be proud of. And if you look at that as you know, one bottom line indicator, the SAT results are really a reflection of the great work that's going on by our, our, um, our students and our teachers. So that's just a sampling. There's so much more that we look at in terms of understanding student growth and success. So, the rest is Sue's. I'll, I'll be happy to click through for you. Or I you got, got my you got your click. You want high tech here? All right. We um, tried the smart board this morning and it was an epic fail. So this is as high tech as we have, I guess. But um, just wanted to talk about. I, I just want you to know. It feels kind of funny to talk about all this academic stuff now after all this like warm and fuzzy stuff that just happened. So get ready for your uh, academic. <laughs> So here's some ways we look at MCAS data. I'm not going to read every bullet for you. Um, you all know this. Uh, we look at our results relative to the state's results. Uh, is the state trending the same way we're trending? Uh, if something looks fishy for us and we didn't do particularly well in an area that we thought we should do, we look at the state to see if the state was trending down as well. Uh, if that's the case, we consider the reasons why that might be. Bad test that year, other, other kinds of things. Um, we look at how we do relative to similar districts, districts in the areas, districts uh, towards Boston. Um, we look at changes over years. Um, it, and Mark talked before, but we can look at this from a district level, uh, a school level, a classroom level, and a student level. So we can really drill the data down to see you know, where students are doing well and, and where they need some shoring up. So this is another interesting MCAS year. So we only have two years of data for K-8 students. They took the next generation, uh, the last two years, for ELA and math. It's also the first year of a new accountability system, and that's a way of kind of ranking um, the district and schools uh, against uh, other districts in the state. Um, so you can no longer care, uh, compare your accountability data from years prior all new system this year. So I'll try to talk about that a little bit. And not very important, but growth scores. Um, my favorite score really to look at is calculated now using mean rather than median to take into account the real outliers and to kind of negate those a little bit, I think, so. Sue, so on that, is that, can I ask a question? Sure. Oh, sorry. <laughs> on, on that one, too, <clears throat> if you have a cohort that's doing extremely well, that's gonna unbalance it. If you have a cohort that's doing, yes, that could unbalance it. But I think they're more talking about if you have outliers. So is this a state measure or a town measure? That's a state measure. Okay, good. Yeah. All right, thank yeah. you. But if you had, a, as far as growth scores are concerned, if you had a cohort that was doing really well, you would be comparing them to a cohort somewhere else that was doing really well, right? Um, and this all started because the federal government um, wants to make sure that we are doing right by kids. And um, clearly, after tonight's presentations, you know that we are doing right by kids. Uh, the state is doing right by kids, and, and we are one of the best districts in the state. And I think that uh, ESSA would be proud of us. So this is uh, their criteria. Um, they want us to look at, at academic achievement, uh, measure of student growth or progress, emphasis on lowest performing students. That is new this year. Graduation rates for high school. Um, progress in achieving English proficiency for English learners, that's a new measure this year, uh, and at least one other measure of school quality. So this is how Massachusetts answered that call. We um, consider MCAS data for uh, growth and achievement, um, ELL assessment data for our students who are not native English speakers, um, chronic absenteeism data, 
we look at students who have been absent more than 10% of the school year, and um, advanced coursework completion, uh, the graduation rate, which is fantastic, the dropout rate, which is nil here, and then the uh, data on our lowest performing group. So yeah, just this is sort of an example, of, you know, maybe where the pendulum is starting to swing back, where because of the federal law and the state's response, we're starting to look at other indicators. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's still not a lot of weight on the on the sort of non-achievement factors, but the pendulum's starting to center <clears throat> itself, I'd say. So just a little lesson on growth scores and achievement scores. Achievement scores are uh, a measure on how a student performs on a test, basically, an assessment that day, in that moment, in that moment of time. So uh, it's a snapshot of how students are doing on their math and their ELA and their science, and lots of factors um, weigh in on test taking. Some students have test anxiety. Some students are amazing test takers. Um, you know, it, it, it could be the test is a morning test and they're an afternoon kid. So there's all kinds of factors that come into play with achievement scores. Growth scores are um, a better indicator of how a student is doing or a group of students <coughs> is doing because they measure the growth over consecutive years. And um, they're, hard, they're kind of hard to explain, but uh, a group of students uh, performs on a, an assessment uh, it, and, uh, and they get a grade of X, let's say. They are compared with another group of students who perform similarly and got the grade of X. And then the next year, those two groups um, are compared and their scores are compared. So they're, you can see how students really grew against their very similar like peers. Okay. Can't see that probably. This is just the achievement levels that you probably got. Let's see, all of you got MCAS home this year, most of you. So, um, not all of you, most of you, right? Got MCAS home? That's their indicators for achievement levels and 2.0. And then we also had the legacy tests, so um, in science and at the high school, and those are different indicators or different achievement levels to take a look at. So we had a whole lot of assessments going on. We did the math earlier today. I can't remember now, Marty, how many different assessments we had, but... Um, 17. 17, 18, yeah. something yeah. like that. Um, yeah. uh, uh, between grades three and eight, ELA and math are the, the new next generation MCAS and the computer I mean, and they're on the computer, and science is the legacy or the old test, and um, it's paper-based. I don't know why it says computer-based, sorry. Um, in high school, uh, students are taking the legacy MCAS across the board, and they're all paper-based. They were last year. This year, everyone's on the computer. Everyone's on next gen. So these are our weighted accountability measures relative to what ESSA has required of us and what the state has decided. We look at achievement, student growth, English language proficiency, and additional indicators like absenteeism and uh, things like that. And um, this is great for grades three through eight. And then the measures for high school, they spread them out a little more because they look at other indicators like a dropout rate, uh, for your cohort graduation rate, extended engagement rate is an interesting one. That's um, how we do with our students who need to continue on. We don't necessarily get a diploma, but need a fifth year or to get ready to go out into the workforce. So um, that's a, a great indicator in my opinion. <laughs> this is just a humorous slide. This is how the targets are calculated. So if anybody wants to do this math, it's funnier when I put it up there, but. <laughs> <laughs> It, it, it has been uh, the, the accountability system, the, the achievement results, are, we're two years in, but the accountability ratings that we received, this is our first yeah. year, and that's, that's how our target accountability uh, rates were established. So if anyone, there are any actuaries, we could use some help. But I, um, Sue has, has taken a deep dive into the in, into understanding how our accountability levels were determined and so. Yeah, not as funny as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> <laughs> Here's our categorization of schools for accountability, um, different than the prior years. Um, the majority of the schools fall in uh, this, this area here. Um, the goal is to have schools work towards meeting new targets. Um, schools that meet targets of 70, uh, at 75% or over 
are meeting and schools that meet them between 0 and 74 are partially meeting. And then they, they pull it apart a little farther than that. But, um, so you call it, this replaces the old 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 oh, ratings that the, the levels. That, that, would pre that previously had given schools. Right. So here's how we fared. Meeting targets and partially meeting targets. This works. Here is the percentage at which each school met targets. So anybody over 75% met targets, those between really zero and 74 are progressing. And then uh, a percentile rank is assigned to students for an overall performance. Um, and they're, it's, it's just a, a compared to like schools, similar schools. So all middle schools are compared and everybody gets a percentile based on their accountability. And there we are again. Mike, maybe we can pause there because again, this is, this is brand new. It's brand new to us and it's, we've been immersed in this for several weeks and it's obviously new to the committee. Yeah. So I don't know if you have questions on this is the accountability side of the MCAS reports that we received. So it might be worth pausing for a minute just to see if you have any questions at all. If it all makes sense. <laughs> so um, I do have a question about this because I know how it was before and the targets were determined based on where you were at a particular moment in time. And so every school had a different target. Now, it, you showed the formula for targets on, on that <clears throat> previous slide. Is that how they're figuring out the targets? here for each school? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, that they, is there was like 50% of the, the, the target last time, you know, for the last accountability system, if they got, if you got 50%, you were meeting, this is much, the, this, this is, is much different. And in, um, is that just, was that determined just for this year? This is, these targets are based on? As far as I know, they're just for this year, but, um, they're really wanting to have like more like four years of data and things like that before they make any more decisions. So I think so there's. Can you go back? To I'd that love them to be that forever. That the targets. Tell me when to stop, Stephanie. This one. So is no the fun one. <laughs> right, but th is this how they're determining? So I mean, not all of them because they have um, high school completion weight on the top of that, so that wouldn't apply to. The, the, right. right. So they spread those targets out into the other areas. Okay. For, for they spread the yeah. weighting out. But this is how they're calculating. That is how they're calculating. Um, yep. Okay. And Karen, you want something? I did. Oh, so, um, Karen. so on the for our schools that are partially meeting targets, it says not requiring assistance or intervention. At what point would it require? Uh, like, why are we not required? Let's go back to there. there. So um, about 15% of schools, the lowest 15% are deemed to be needing assistance. So we are well above that. You know, underperforming, chronically underperforming schools, chronic absenteeism. That's also a different formula. Okay, so, what, so it would be, you, is there ever a time when a partially meeting would need no. Would require assistance. No. no. You could slide back. Yeah, you'd have to it would be worse. It would, okay. Yeah. But it would if be you can't partially meet and you're not in the ease system. Yeah. Got it. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. I just want to now back to the slide where we have the percentiles because I know this is the only um, slide that really breaks down the schools. So Wait, I would. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, at a future date, I would like to explore, um, and there's more data. I had gone through um, this, and I know it's it's broken up by by district, and I have um, it by looked at it by subgroup. I've looked at it by school, and I would just ask at a future date, whether it's a workshop or something, I'd like to look at the um, variability that I see across the schools. Um, and that for me, you know, there's, there's benefits and I agree with you, the, the, the student growth percentiles is what I look at. Uh, that's a big one. But then um, another piece, you know, that's a red flag 
or a flag. Mm -hmm. You know, there's some things with MCAS that, you know, you don't, the minutia. But when something (laughs) stands out and I see this variability and you think about um, where, where, what you want to target, how you want to target, where you want to put money, um, you know, these are benchmarks that are the same across the district and you have people performing differently. So I'd like to explore that, whether we do it in a workshop or something, um, what's happening and where we can support or what's working and what, what's not. That would be a fun way to do it in a workshop, I think. I, may, I, yeah. I think maybe that's well, a better... We can pull up different reports and look at them. Yeah. And, yeah. So I just, I know this was one slide that broke it apart by the school, so I just yep. wanted to but offer I just that thought. comment on that, and I'm glad you brought it up, because I think our initial discussion was this is going to give you an overview of MCAS and how, how the district did um, with the intention of whether at a meeting or a workshop to bring the principals back in and do more of a, um, a more, Q&A maybe a, or a d- deeper dive questions. into the data a little bit. And I hear or? that, and I think that each principal will present, but I think as an over, mm-hmm. you know, in, in sort of what this is presenting is that overview and looking at it holistically, whereas one principal will report on their school, but, but not looking at it as across like the elementary, which is three yeah. schools, or the yeah. middle schools, which is two. Yeah. And I really would like to look at that scatter and variability that exists that maybe the principal can't speak to the others. Right, so. and I think for us it speaks to um, curriculum alignment. Like that's something I think about when I see disparity. Potentially. Um, mm-hmm. You know, whether it's, yep. like if I look at Glenbrook right now and Williams, mm-hmm. um, <clears throat> and then I look at Center and Wolf Swamp in comparison to Blueberry, and my, I always go to curriculum alignment. Like what's happening where mm-hmm. um, somebody would be performing yeah. at a, a bigger a gap. So. Whether we can discuss that, whether it's going to be a you know a workshop and who we invite to that, and I think we do address that. Yeah, um, yeah, because I had taken a, a pretty deep look at some of the data just early on, and you know one of the things that struck me about what you were just talking about was like Blueberry. There is a cohort of students at Blueberry that is far exceeding the rest of the district. That's kind of like pulling that one up, and I don't know how. And I, that I think a workshop is a good way to look at that because. I also think that cohort's pushing into the Glenbrook versus Williams as well. So I, I, I think taking a deeper dive on those type of data yeah. points would be pretty good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So to be clear, the principals have taken a deeper dive into it already. They weren't asked to come tonight to present, but they've been talking about, you know, well, what are you doing and how is this affecting your students and things like that. So making sure they get their credit. Um, this is a, the district accountability report, and uh, again, I know you probably can't see that, um, or, or else we just are really no, I think, I think poorly was... cited here at central office, but um, it, it's kind of a, what happens is they take the scores and they turn them into um, weighted scores on a scale of one to four. So I, I can't explain the whole thing now. I, I would definitely do it wrong. However, that I want you to take a look at, that's what our accountability looks like. This is... Um, a little different if you pulled it up online, Stephanie. This is a little bit different because this is just Long Meadow High School students. I was going to say your not, numbers. Not all high school students. I switched it. Okay, because I have 86 and yeah. 66 there, and you got 92. And that included our out of district students. Okay. That that one. So I I just wanted to. And that that's good. And that I it's interesting because I was wondering there was quite the discrepancy mm-hmm. between those percentiles where I had you had 86 and then you had. 66 yeah. between the all and the lowest Low. and this is a little closer mm-hmm. but it's still mm-hmm. a bit far so that's we're trying to understand that district level report versus the long meadow high report yeah you know, district level 912 versus long meadow high 912 so that's yeah. something that we got to look at our yeah. mcas scores get reported back for our students that are placed out of district by us in schools that we fund those students are required to take mcas so um, those mm-hmm. those scores get reported in in, in our did, data. Did you have any thoughts about even between the the 92 and the 75 there being that gap there? They seem to, you know. But anyway, we can yeah. talk about that later. Yeah. Oh, we've had a lot of thoughts about <laughs> that. <laughs> okay. Okay, you can't see this either, probably. This is uh, an example of one NCAS report. So if we did a workshop, we could pull up reports that don't have student names on them and potentially not teacher names on them. 
uh, and, and take a deeper dive into the data and look. But um, if you look a little closer, um, this is how we can compare some data. So on the right, we have district results and state results, and these are individual questions here, right? And so we see, we want to be above the state on every category, right? And so we saw here that we were really just, we had just a four point difference. That's unusual for us. We usually have a greater difference than that. So we can, uh, with the data that we have, kind of go ahead and take a look at that question. And the question addresses the standard about analyzing how events affect a character. And we can look at the question. Is it a fair question? Did it seem like it was a good question for our students? How did they, you know, how are they answering it? Why are they getting it wrong? It's only a one point question there. Uh, so it's a fill in the blank. But um, so we're able to, to dive down that deeply and look at questions. And so we're finding a bunch of uh, students who are having a hard time synthesizing uh, characters and things like that. Then, you know, we'll do work in those areas. So these are the actual graphs, and I won't um, spend too long on them. I'll just uh, let you peek at them. Um, the bottom here is the percentage of students uh, meeting or exceeding. And I just want you to keep in mind, this is just the second year of this next-gen MCAS test. So um, it's always good to have like, four years of data to really do some good comparisons. I think that the thing that we think about, too, is how many students can shift um, those bars, mm. you know, so with, if there's 200 students at a particular grade level, let's say grade five taking the test, then every, every Four. two students is 1%, 1 right. right? So help me out, Mr. Maz, if I got that right. But, you know, that's, that's what we're talking about here when, when, we, when we're looking for the, we obviously want to see the shift go towards more kids meeting and exceeding expectations, but we have to recognize, you know, we should tear it apart to think about how many students that each percentage point represents. So, so it's two to one, two to one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry, I will slow down if you'd like me to. Uh, this is the district's comparison against the state. And in almost all cases, we've exceeded the state uh, MCAS. It's tough because two years of data, you know, we also have to ask ourselves, you know, uh, how many years establishes a trend, and when do we want it, when do we want to make the big instructional adjustments as opposed to, you know, perhaps <coughs> the minor instructional adjustments, you know, relating to a particular standard. You know, so. On the right, I have the student growth percentile. And a student growth percentile um, at 50 is straight in the middle, in, uh, you know, flat average, and uh, the range is between 40 and 60. So we love to see our growth percentiles up in the high 50s um, or 60s. It's tough to get up there. Um, and we don't want them down in the, in the 40s. So um, we take a look at that when we, when we look at growth scores like that. So just th those are those scores over on the right. Can I just say something? Um, when talking about the newness of this test, I, I hear that. And then also, you know, looking at those student growth percentiles broken down by school, you do see that scatter. So when you mm -hmm. talk about, you know, you don't want to maybe implement something based on, you know, the newness of this test, but you do want to look at why we have such right. scatter. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, science and tech engineering has more data, but it's the old test. Looking uh, at a lot of the old standards, we have new standards. So um, here's our data there. And, okay. and this mirrors the state. You look at the state as well. Uh, only the state was lower, but same trending. And nice 58 growth score there. Science. So the principals came up with their focus areas as a district, and it was hard for them to look as a district, right? Because they're digging into their data at their own school. Um, <clears throat> but they're happy that many of their high needs subgroups met or exceeded targets in ELA. That was awesome. Um, 
Heine's outperformed the state in all areas except third grade ELA, and they were really close there. Um, we had some high growth in fifth grade, um, high growth in math in fifth grade for a lower subgroup, lower group. Uh, areas for improvement, math achievement, um, growth for ELA students with disabilities, um, achievement in science for students with disabilities. I mean, we're always, um, part of the new accountability system is a focus on bringing the lower group up, right? Kind of trying to close that gap, which is why they put an emphasis on the lower group as far as um, accountability is concerned. They really want districts to, to stand up and take notice of these kids. And I think it's really pointed at districts who have chronic absenteeism and lots of kids in poverty and things like that, but we, you know, need to take notice of that as well. Strategies for continuous improvement, continuing the math expression program, digging deeper into that workshop model there, um, continuing the ELA in class coaching in the areas where um, over the last few years we've seen like, uh, I think one year fifth grade just shot up in writing. Um, they had uh, the ELA coaches were focusing on fifth grade in, in writing in that, that particular year, and it really showed in the MCAS assessment. So, um, this is how do you spread it out, right? Um, the students will start using the Chromebooks more often so that they just have more familiarity with them when they go to take the assessment. And we've bought some science books, science books for our library kids might be interested in. Science stories, I'll call them, not textbooks. Sixth grade ELA. <clears throat> so that growth percentile of 44 was a concern. Um, they're digging into that at grade six to see what might have happened there. Um, looking at the cohort of students. Seventh grade ELA. Yes. SGP, that's 61 growth in ELA. A lot of kids there. And the trend is, too, as kids move through the year, their scores go up in all subjects usually. Eighth grade math, that was a great jump there. Different kids, don't forget, you're not comparing the same kids when you're looking at achievement scores, looking at a different group coming in behind, but. I mean, you go back to that, I mean, that's an area that we're, we're looking at that, oh, okay. I mean, um, the, the state is trending downward at eighth grade in science as well, but um, we're hoping that the investment that we made in science this year will start to pay dividends there. Science has been a bit of a moving target uh, for teachers everywhere. For so yeah, Next reasons. Generation Science Standards came out, what, four, three or four years ago, followed the following year by the mass framework. So. Our students switched to the NGSS standards, and then they switched to the mass frameworks, which were pretty close. But this is the first year that our eighth graders will have text to follow along with those standards. And this is the old test, so still kind of asking some of the older questions. And so we're hoping for different results on a different test. Yeah, new books. Eight, new books. Yes, thank you. Nice growth score there, eighth grade. <coughs> All right, against the state. One job for the state. And our middle school principals are pretty happy that both of their middle schools are in the top 25 percentile of schools. Um, high growth in seventh grade ELA. High growth in eighth grade ELA for students with disabilities. The other thing we can do with this data is look at groups of students, um, many, like maybe 10 or 11 different subcategories of students to <coughs> see how they perform, which we do. So, sorry. Areas for improvement at middle school. This is just a snippet. Uh, achievement for high needs categories and grade 
I need math grade six. We had lower growth in sixth grade in ELA than we would have preferred. Continuous improvement strategies. Um, we are as a district undergoing uh, refinement and alignment of the RTI process. So we're looking at uh, what all the schools are doing and, and taking best practice from all the schools and kind of aligning them. Lots of targeted assistance. I think like every year we put more and more targeted assistance in for students. Um, we've had lots of inclusive practices. PD, we continue to have that. Um, you know, we're looking at cross-curricular units of study and we're refining science scope and sequence too. I think, it's, I think worth noting for me at least that the English language curriculum study group. Oh yeah, um, I missed it. So, Sorry. you know, bringing together middle level educators to study um, literacy instruction. And so there's an eager group that Sue is leading um, that's going to look at our literacy practices <coughs> and hopefully bring a greater degree of alignment uh, in that area. So that's a, that's a big push for us in terms of curriculum alignment work this year. Tenth grade ELA, by the time our students get to 10th grade, they are <coughs> on their way <laughs> to great things. Um, scores like that are just pretty incredible and speak for themselves. Again, old test, not the new one. This will be the first year. Math. Bio. I mean, just the difference in the state advanced compared to us, I think it's pretty impressive. <clears throat> so the high school is celebrating all of their really high scores. All over the place. And they are still focused on um, response to writing to text, especially um, in biology and the higher sciences. A higher level math questions, meeting the readiness needs of students who complete a portfolio assessment. So um, we have students who don't actually take the MCAS, they take a different assessment, but their scores get popped into the MCAS as well. We want to make sure that we're meeting the needs of those students so that they can take that portfolio <coughs> assessment to uh, the best of their ability. Longwater has a busy few years ahead there in the NIASC process. They just started, right? Um, and MCAS is going to look very different for them next year. It's the first time they will take a computer-based MCAS assessment, and the first time they'll take the next generation Can I, at I the just, high school. Uh, pause on that, the NEASC accreditation process. Uh, Beth and I were chatting about maybe uh, having the high school admin uh, or members of the reaccreditation team report to you at some point in the future on the reaccreditation process. The new change that NEASC is rolling out is this idea of formulating the vision of the graduate. So uh, with the community, with parents, with the school committee, with teachers, with kids, trying to really articulate what, what we expect out of students by the time they graduate, by the time they leave us in 12th grade. And so that visioning process um, is just getting kicked off. I think it's a, got great potential to help us really sort of continually reinvent and update um, curriculum and instruction mm -hmm. in high school. So I hope we can bring that information to you at some point in the future. It's a lot of work. I mean, they, they, as Sue said, the high school will be busy um, responding to MCAS 2.0 and uh, the NEASC accreditation process. Were there changes made when they um, the mass reviewed the um, curriculum were there changes made as a result of that well I know there were some change I don't remember specifically yeah. but was this literature one of them because I know with, with the common core standards one of the issues was that this literature had been pulled out and they were focusing more on you know close reading and mm -hmm. things yep text. Um, deep reading synthesizing analyzing text analyzing you know um, fiction and nonfiction both. And so as soon as the frameworks were changed, 
um, the English department at the high school and the middle school got together, um, looked at literature that they wanted to kind of dive into, the, some deeper, richer text, and so they were on it pretty quickly. They're anticipating the new assessment, so they've been doing a lot of work in that area. They are, mm -hmm. They're doing um, cross-curriculum units, they're writing in uh, history and social sciences at both the high school and the middle school, um, in science and in math as well, so they're gearing up for it. But yeah, that was as a result of those, it was a framework um, modification, kind of. It was a, not a whole yeah, new remanding of it. That yeah. was one of the rest associated with that, and when we were in that fiction and some of the other literature that there was going to be some loss of thinking. Right, stronger emphasis on nonfiction. Yeah. 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 Just a uh, little good news, these are the ACT scores. Uh, for our students at high school, pretty cool, huh? I think, what were they the highest scores? High scores in five years. In five years. Uh, across the board on the ACTs. Well done. And, because I knew Stephanie would ask, <laughs> the surveys, which I'm waiting for too. Uh, we'll have their data released sometime soon. I couldn't get a release date, but um, have a little more hope for the surveys this time around. They've had a year to refine them, and the surveys uh, address engagement, safety, and environmental um, issues, and so they will come back and we'll compare them to last year's surveys, but they will give us some good data, I think, on social-emotional learning as well. So we'll let you know when those come back. That's it. All right. <laughs> So before I open it up to questions or any other comments that you, you all have, I just wanted to address one housekeeping issue that um, I am hoping will make us be more successful across the board as a, a governance team. And I think um, what I'm really looking for Dorothy Presser to address during our norms and protocols workshop coming up is um, when we do have reports, especially these really dense, mm -hmm. um, thick MCAS reports, that we start to establish more of a timeline so that we're not getting the material 24 hours, 48 hours in, in advance. And I, I don't know what the track changes were in your presentation. I know we got in this just now. Yeah. But even like when it's in our drive on a Friday and it's almost 40 pages and then we don't have the actual packet on Monday, I think it's prohibitive knowing what I'm hearing from this group um, in this audience that we are going to be diving into this material. I heard Armand say he took a lot of time with his. I know Melanie's been looking at MCAS scores before she was even on school committee. I'm looking at Stephanie's mocked up um, paperwork with all of her tabs. So knowing that we do want to do this work, um, we really need to make a better effort, I think, of having the information so that we can, we're all spread thinly, I know, um, admin and school committee alike, but I think it's just a win-win for all of us because I think once we have the, and whether Dorothy has suggestions for how to do that better, I'm all for it. Um, whether we establish a timeline, I'm always looking for ways where we can work um, smarter and not harder, but also how we're setting ourselves up for like, we're not all gonna be here one day, right? how we can make it so committees are always gonna be successful after us yeah. so that we Part of, the uncast, that up. part of the uncast is that it's been different for the last three or four years, right? Every <coughs> every report that we give has been different based on some changes that they're making. And I think it was so, in that vein, it would really be great to know what what you expected out of the report. I think it would be a lot easier for, for us than to say, well, I think this would be great, this would be great, and this would be great. So that would be really helpful on that. Yeah. And I would, then I would stop, right? And I'd say, okay, this is what they want. And I wouldn't try to keep guessing. Well, that's good feedback. Yeah. And then I think for us also to know that I know Marty's always been great about asking for questions prior to, and I think a nice way for us to be able to maybe condense our meetings is if we get more of that lead time with the material, we can digest it, and then I think there's more than enough time to get questions to you. I didn't have time to get questions to you. I know me personally with the amount of information I had to look. And that way you can kind of address those questions, and it, I think, will alleviate some of the you know, I'm all for a discussion and, and having questions at the meeting, but I think that's, I'm always looking for ways to improve, mm -hmm. is, is what I would say. And I know that, you know, getting the reports mm -hmm. in a in a earlier fashion is just something I'm looking at. So it's a very similar report, but I, yeah, that would be great to just say, you know, I want it a week before the meeting or something like that, so then we would 
the LDS. Yeah. So I think if you had questions, we could answer them before we got here. That'd be yeah. awesome. I think it's helpful for everybody. Yeah. I just wanted to, and then that's all I wanted to say about that because it is something I want to bring up with Dorothy and how we can um, not work harder but work smarter, I guess, would be our goal. But I would open it up to the rest of the committee. I know people asked throughout the presentation, so do you feel that was sufficient? Um, did you get your questions answered as Sue and Marty were going through? And then I think the workshop idea is a nice idea to do that kind of deeper dive. Does anyone have any additional? Stephanie? I just wanted to make um, <laughs> one comment, and I do think that um, it would be nice to look at uh, the district holistically, you know, when you're looking across different schools. And one thing, um, you know, when you talk about is the elementary focus areas that were on here, I just wanted to, and this would be one thing, if I had had this sooner, I would have brought it to your attention before now, but I feel since it was presented, I do want to just say I I am really pleased to see the, um, the emphasis on um, narrowing that achievement gap far and away, really excited to see it. But then at the same time, it's very heavy on um, students with disabilities needing improvement and gives the impression I, I wouldn't want to give the impression that we don't have other areas to improve because we okay. certainly do so yep. I just don't want it to you know when just looking at this I don't want it to seem like our scores if they're low in an area are because students with disabilities are pulling it down I really because that's just not in fact true so when we talk about areas of improvement when we look more at this, I think I'd like more of a holistic as well view across the schools, um, looking at that scatter, and then, um, you know, I think this was just where some principals were looking, mm -hmm. you know, target and just picking certain right. things out, and right. that's totally I I appreciate that you're saying that because I was trying to understand where, you know, some areas for celebration. It was just kind of picked here and there, it's you know, like it they felt, wasn't they felt proud of. It was hard work for them to kind of look at right, like from a bird's eye down. You know, they always want to dive in and fix whatever yeah. that they thought wasn't good enough and, and so i think that's where it comes into play where you're looking at the district as a whole and the differences between the schools and in doing what one principal isn't necessarily <laughs> going to be looking at for the other school and, right. and i think that that is one benefit of the mcas yeah. um, is being able to do that so i'd like to see those areas for improvement really looking at it more you know holistically across um, the district and not just heavy on on one subgroup I think principals struggle with that mm -hmm. exercise um, say center school did extremely well somewhere and blueberry didn't and I think it's a really hard conversation to have like for for principals sometimes why did you do so well why did we do so poorly and you know there's this pride and celebration kind of happening here or wanting to happen and yeah. this I feel badly about it over here so it's I a, think it's know. that context of curriculum alignment which yeah. is also part of our you know what we're looking to address mm -hmm. so I think in the context of curriculum alignment that's what I would be looking at is there a difference there I mean you're going to have some variability yeah. but when we have um, noted that the alignment is not occurring that would be one thing I would check out you know whether that's in fact it or maybe there's yeah. just some you know I, I, I don't know what it is but yeah. I thought maybe a workshop would yeah. be a good you should place come in we should maybe talk about what we want to see at that workshop that might be helpful okay, okay. Well, I think, um, if I can, yeah go ahead so I've been living this for a few months now <laughs> since this is part of my daily life and you can s see the subgroups and exactly which ones did worse and the for us, we did, first of all, we didn't get the targets until after the test. So we didn't actually know what the targets were. They were created from the test. Mm -hmm. So you took the test, and then a few months later, you found out what your targets were, and then you were told whether or not you met your targets. <laughs> so that's just an important thing to remember for all the principals. They didn't know what the targets were going in. And the lowest performing, 25%, were created from the test, for which you didn't even know what the targets were. So. When you go onto the DESI website, and you can break it down by subgroup by each school, and you can really see what their scores were and what their percentage and how many kids it is that make up that particular group. So each principal can. It's not a question for Sue. That's why I really don't. Have a on their account, Sue, on the accountability page, if are you I talking? wanted to talk about chronic absenteeism at the high school, we can go to the high school page and see how many kids it is, and then go, okay, so what are you doing with those 18 kids that made you go from four points to two points? Because that's one of the ones where we lost points. So, all right, so now what is the high school admin doing? How are you engaging those families to get those 18 kids who ruined your score to come to school? Because they can't be chronically absent. They can see the names, 
they know which kids it is, and then they'd be able to answer us or answer to Marty what exactly each of them are doing for that particular group. Um, that's something that I have to do on a daily basis. Um, well, maybe not daily, but every time my supervisor comes to talk to me about it, what am I doing for the lowest performing? Because they count for 50%. So if you're looking at 73 kids at the high school, count for 50% of your score. Or whatever group it was. I was looking at one of them where it was 73 kids, but what could have been one of the middle schools. That's 50% of your score addressing those kids. So yeah, they should look at those kids and figure out what's the difference mm -hmm. between schools, correct, but also just me and my own school. Why did those, that particular group, why did this happen to them? What is going on? What is different for them? They aren't necessarily kids with disabilities, but they could be. So if that is in fact the case at Williams, then they should be looking at that particular, those kids in those programs. So, but it's not, a, it's not something for you to have the answer for. So if we do have a working group or a, a workshop, I think that's when we can really get into what this is, is going on. This is a link, I think. Um, many of you had looked at um, after I'd sent it out just to orient you to the page. So if you just Google DESE school and district profiles, you'll find the links to each of the schools. And so, um, you know, if I were to click on Glenbrook, the accountability tab, and then you can sort by whichever particular cohort that that you want to see or understand. If you, go, if you go back up, Marty, the yeah. second tab above that first graph right there, the detailed, yeah. that's a good, that tab's a good one too, because mm -hmm. then you just scroll. Right. And it shows you on the right what each group did, whether it declined, met, exceeded, and it breaks it down for you. The N shows you how many kids. You only get a score if your N is higher than 20. So if your right. N is less than 20, there's no score. But one thing that they don't um, outline, I, and I don't think, I actually had to go um, on the phone with Desi before to get the information, but I think the district gets it, is you will have the subgroups on there, but you will not have um, a line item for students without disabilities. So you can sit there and, and calculate that all you want, but what I'm saying is it doesn't add up, you can't say that students with disabilities I mean, I, I want to be clear, I want this achievement gap to like go away, but I just want it to show we have other areas of improvement that I want to, you know, yeah, I want to see. Yeah, that, yeah, here. that didn't reflect that in any way. We know that there's areas for growth all over the place. Okay. This is the last person that right. takes that, but yes. Yeah, so you can. It's more of how we message it. Yeah, it just, I, it yes, and I think just hearing that they, they pick pieces out and that's fine. I just wanted it to you know, for anyone who's watching, know that obviously there's there's more than this right here. Um, but I do appreciate, you know, that Desi is looking at, the state's looking at, we're looking at it, yeah. really wanting to get rid of that yeah. achievement gap there. But um, but we have a lot of um, other areas that we want to see too. Anyone else have anything to? Thank you, Sue, thank you for thank the you, work sir. on that, and thank you, Marty, for the presentation and the work on that. Um, and we will follow up at some point with uh, a workshop. Um, we can move on to our resolutions for the MASC uh, business meeting, which is um, the school committee members will be attending the MASC Mass Joint Conference on November 7th through the 9th this year. Um, next month actually and the MASC annual business meeting occurs on November 9th which is the Friday of the conference uh, I believe it's at 315 so enclosed in our packet um, are the resolutions that that I asked everyone to look at being brought forward for our consideration and the school committee also needs to provide guidance um, to vote a delegate as how you would like that person to vote on their behalf but first we have to obviously appoint <coughs> the voting delegate delegate so then we have a motion for that and then we do have the nine resolutions so once we appoint the delegate we can then move on to that so we have a possible motion if anyone wants to I guess we should obviously clarify who's going to the conference I know Ryan's going Karen's going I'm going Melanie Bronwyn and AJ, are you available? We're in the middle of our move. You're yeah, right, not. And because Bronwyn, you were, correct? Yeah. Going? Okay. Because the vote would be taking place on Friday. Though. Yeah, it would be on Friday. I mean, I think I said in my email um, past history what we've done is nominate the chair to be the delegate. Um, I'm happy to do that. It obviously does not have to be me. I'm okay not being the delegate. Whatever you guys want to 
um, do I, to, I will just to move this along. along. Before <laughs> that, I would probably be yeah, first thing in the morning. I'm okay. going to get out of town, so it would not be me. Okay. That's your I'll nominate team. Beth Barron to be the law middle school committee voting delegate at the annual MASC business meeting. Second. Second. <laughs> Can't say I didn't see that coming. But um, no further discussion. We'll call for a vote. All those in favor? Any abstaining or opposing? I'm abstaining. Um, so that passes. Um, I'm going to nominate Karen Morin to be the alternate. Thanks for bringing that to my attention. Yeah. I'll nominate Karen Morin to be the alternate delegate at the MASC uh, November 9th delegate meeting. So, Armand is seconding that. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Any opposed or abstaining? Karen, you're the delegate. You all join it. You're the alternate. <laughs> <laughs> you walked right into that one. Um, so doing that, I noticed it's 3:15 on that Friday. That they didn't do it. At, no, they did. That, it. They, they did, did it. Earlier I think on. at the beginning last year, right? Yeah, like because a I know a lot of the population falls off it. I'm just yeah. curious why they made that change. A lot of people keep you there because they're yeah. there. People want to stay they till Saturday. You. Well, you know what? They had a lot of great things on Saturday, and that was one of the feedback that I gave. You know, on that survey was I, I wanted. You know, it's like, why did you save everything for the end? You know, I, I wanted to go, but I couldn't. Um, so, not that I don't want to stay, but somebody wants me to somebody drive has back to from stay. the Cape on a Friday. Yeah, you're not going to be leaving at five o'clock from the Cape on a Friday. Well, There's a couple of Saturday ones that I do actually want to go to too. Um, but anyway, in the interest of time, we all looked at the resolutions. Um, I know Marty had said if we had any clarifying points that we wanted to ask him. Um, otherwise, we can just move through these, start making motions and voting. I grouped them all together, but I have no idea how the, the vote would, I don't want to anticipate that we would all be unanimous, because we certainly don't have to be. Um, do you want to wait to, for each one? Like, I have a question on resolution five. Do you want to wait? Do no, I think we should do, well, why don't you just do the questions? That's kind of a general question. No, we'll wait one, one second on that. Sure. Do you think? I think we would do our questions first if you want to clarify any of the specific yeah. and then Bronwyn, what was your question? It's just a general question. So um, this stuff goes out to all the school committees and then you bring that to the conference? Correct. All the school committees get the resolutions. Um, some school, from what Marty and I had discussed, some school committees, this is like their big event of the year they really um, focus on the resolutions and they spend a lot of time um, weighing them and then each school committee is represented by a division um, so I believe we're division five um, can't be sure on that but we're all broken down into a division and then once we go to the conference your delegate um, would be present and and um, be your representative for how they would like to know how all of the school committees are voting on these resolutions. There are some school committees that ignore this process, and then there are some that take it very, very seriously and debate it at length. Okay. Well, on that note, I'm, you know, I'm just going to add. Well, there's, to me, a lot of these issues are not clear cut, and they're very involved. And I would have to do so much research for me to feel like I could appropriately give an answer to these, and I am actually not very comfortable giving a vote and may abstain from voting on a lot of the issues. Um, you know, it's kind of like, you know, the ballot issues that we have coming from. So I have the ballot booklet in front of me, mm -hmm. and I can read those, and I can say, well, this is if you vote yes, and this is if you can vote no. And some people say, well, it's very clear. Yes vote does this, and no vote does that. I don't see it that way. I don't think it's very clear at all, a lot of these issues. Um, so, and I don't really have the time to put in, and I understand the school committee's role in having an input. But I myself would have to take, spend so much time because that's what I do before I feel comfortable voting on probably the majority of these. Okay. So I may be abstaining uh, from voting altogether. I guess I would say to that point, and maybe Diane or Marty could answer this, I'm not really sure when the time frame is when MASC rolls out the resolutions. Because I'm just thinking going forward for next year, maybe we 
move the MASC resolutions if, if we want to put more weight or emphasis on our discussion. How soon do they establish those? I know. Normally much earlier. They yeah, were they were, they were late, late. And, and, and we didn't receive any mailings on it. And I'm not sure, I don't know if any committee members yeah, received it. It was yeah. late though when it I was got it too. Did not I get just, any of the books in week? our office. Yeah. This, right? yeah. yeah. So we didn't get any of that. And so I actually have it on my on my calendar to give it to you. Yeah. And I kept thinking, I haven't gotten anything. I, so I mentioned it to Marty, and we actually went online to get them. Was it in that book? Yeah, they're all in here. The resolutions? The resolutions are in here. Okay. Mm. And you know, a lot of these issues, I mean, they're very hot, hot button topic issues. And I think we could run into some, um, you know, I don't know. It's, it's it's hard to have a conversation about these issues in general with people these days, whether it's the, the gun control, or the, 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 the you know, sex education in school and how you're going to address that, or abolishing the Department of Education. I mean, so many of these have are, I don't know, I don't know, I, I, don't, I don't know, opening up discussion, I don't know how that would go with either, because I think a lot of these are, can be politically motivated. I mean, one of them happens to be on the ballot question, so you can't. <laughs> Pull the politics out of it. It's a it's a question that's going to be voted on on, a, on one of the ballots. It's similar, at, at least in terms of the content. And I, I think we just I don't know run the risk of dealing with some delicate, superly charged um, issues. It's, again, my own point. So I may just not be contributing at all. I would agree with you. I think that um, last year I would say the resolutions were not as emotional or weighty. Um, but knowing that you know we do have to mm -hmm. go through them. Um, did you have a specific question about one, or do you think maybe we just start going through them in that can, way? It sounds like we might have some discussion. Resolution yeah. <laughs> so let's just start with one and go down the. Um, so we do have a possible motion for the first resolution. Um, if anyone wants to make the motion, then I can open it up to discussion. Some maybe we'll just have no discussion at all. Some maybe we'll have a little bit of clarifying information. Move to support resolution one, rejecting the arming of educators. Second. Any discussion or comments on that? If not, I would call for a vote on that. All those in favor? Any opposed or abstaining? I'm abstain. 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 So we'll move on to. I'm sorry, Stephanie, I didn't see your. Was that a motion pass? Uh, yes, I okay. Did. Sorry, I did. <laughs> yeah, I want to. I was going to move on to two before I realized. Um, so, possible motion for resolution two. I move the school committee support resolution two on small and rural districts. Second. Any ongoing discussion or questions on that? If not, I'll call for a vote. All those in favor? <laughs> Any opposed or abstaining? Abstain. Abstain. So that motion passes as well. Move the school committee support resolution three, elimination of the Federal Department of Education. Second. Any discussion or get clarifying questions on that? Could I offer a clarifying? Sure, absolutely. For anyone watching at home, the, the motion is to reject the elimination of the Federal Department of Education. So. I only took it at its title. Right, yes. That's, it, it, that's why reading I, the title, it appear, I, I, I wouldn't want anyone at home to think that <laughs> this committee is potentially <laughs> in favor of eliminating yeah. the U.S. Department of Education. Right, right. That, thanks for the <laughs> clarification on how that reads. Um, <laughs> that could definitely be misconstrued. Um, any other comment or question on that? If not, we'll call for a vote. All those in favor? Any opposed or abstaining? Same. So that motion passes. Um, motion four, resolution four, rather. Where the school committee support resolution four, regional school transportation. Second. Any further comments or questions on resolution four? If not, we'll call for a vote. All those in favor? Any opposed or abstaining? Same. So that motion passes. We move the school committee support resolution five regarding reporting and accountability standards. Second. And I know Karen, you had a specific question or so. I on did this. have a question, just so you're um, all 
understanding where I'm coming from. I had um, emailed <coughs> Glenn Kuchar to get some clarification on Resolution 5 to find out if this, um, number one, to find out what the genesis of this resolution was, if it was becoming a significant state issue, um, and what schools exactly are exempt, because according to law, charter schools and um, private special education schools that receive public funds are required to um, be part of the assessment, or at least do an alternate assessment, um, whether it be a portfolio assessment or something like that. So um, my question to him was, you know, could you provide some clarification? Is this going to have any impact on private special education schools that receive public funds? <coughs> and his response was um, pretty vague. It just said this, um, that there are other schools that get state or federal funds of various kinds and have no exposure to standards, and in some cases, charter, charters are exempt. He didn't give me any information as to which are exempt, why they're exempt, what the reasons are for any of that. So I will be voting no on this one. He gave your Glenn Kutcher answer. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Did you have any further clarification on that, Marty? No, I, 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 I think that there's a general sense among public school district superintendents that uh, some charter schools aren't held to the same enrollment standards, that, that they have greater uh, leeway to um, identify, select their student bodies. But they, but this is accountability and reporting, right? Right. So right. they still have to yeah. still take the assessments. I, I had the same question. So it's it's held to the same standards and requirements. So it's still expected to take the same NCAS tests, charter schools at least. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'll just say, even in um, finance, when we we're looking over the grants, we give grant money. I, grant money comes from the state and will go to the private schools around here. So that would include those. So when we give it to, I mean. I believe the parochial schools are held to the same MCAS standards. But right. But they so, but we, they funds. get those funds. So this, this would essentially make the, you know, St. Mary's take the MCAS uh, or not take that money. And it's not, it, it's not a whole lot. It's a small amount. But um, yes, so it would it would include that. So, um, so it may be one of those things that we don't have a whole lot of information on. I think the vagueness of this the, yeah the, the, this could go off in a bunch of different directions. Yeah, mm -hmm. you, this this might be one you want to stay away from. But. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, seeing that there's no more discussion, we can call for a vote on that. Um, all those in favor. Any opposed or abstaining? I'm abstaining. Oh, that's opposed. Oh, opposed. Oh, yeah. We should do. Oh, let me do it. Let me do it separately. Um, all those opposed. All those abstaining. So that motion fails. And we move on to um, resolution six. Move the school committee to support resolution six regarding reproductive health education. Any discussion or clarifying questions that need to be asked? If not, we can call for a vote. All those in favor? <laughs> Any opposed or abstaining? Okay. So that motion passes 5 2. Or 5 0. Which 5 0 abstaining, two, I'm sorry. 2, abs two abstaining. Um, I move the school committee seven. support Res resolution seven on gender identity inclusive athletic participation policy. Second. Any questions or comments, discussion? Seeing none, we can call for a vote. All those in favor? Any opposed or abstaining? Abstaining, okay. So that's five with two abstaining. Move the school committee support resolution number eight relative to sports wagering. Second. Any comments or clarifying questions that you need to ask? If not, we'll call for a vote on that. All those in favor? Any opposed or abstaining? Abstaining. So five with two abstaining. And resolution nine. I move the school committee support resolution nine relative to access to information for parents and students who are clients of special education. Second. 
any comments or questions on this one? Marty, I, I guess, Marty, was there any clarification from you on this in regards to burden on the district? No, I, I, I mean, all the provide copy via email or mail of all the assessments that are performed by for students in the family's preferred language. I, I sort of feel like that's a requirement already. I, yeah. Okay. I'm but the five days is five added. Days. Five yeah. Days. It's, yeah. When I, I can yeah, tell you, Armin, when I read this, obviously I thought about my day job rather than the night job, and I was thinking, any, any time something like this comes up, I immediately think like how hard it is to get this information to parents sometimes mm -hmm. in an urban district as opposed to Hawks, where. I don't have email addresses. Very often, don't have working phone numbers. And our challenge and sometimes is the translation services. Right. And I can't get a meeting unless they get it five days before. And it is definitely the kind of thing that's going to be a hardship for large urban districts, without a doubt. Less so, long yeah. And that was that was my only concern was that like for work, I have to get translators quite often, and like Creole or Tagalog or other things come up, and it's just like. Can you get it in five days? Uh, that was my only concern. Definitely. I will just say that you would not want to have a meeting without the people understanding what they're going into the meeting for. Absolutely true. So while it may be a hardship, I think that um, this would, you know, I, I think that this would be, I mean, you should not have a meeting unless they understand what they're reading. And then sometimes people will go in the meeting not having it. I think it's like 48 hours right now. You have, you have a right to... Uh, the assessments, but you have to request them. Uh, this is actually just saying that they have to give them five days. So, yeah, I don't know. I was trying before just to push that they would give them two days without requesting. Is so it five days is, before the meeting? Is this says is? Or five, five days, days prior to any meeting. Prior to the prior meeting. To the meeting. When they'll review the um, proposed IEP. So it wouldn't necessarily be the first one because, well, yes, it would be because you're discussing a possibility of, would it be for an eligibility? Could be. So it would sure. be five days. Yeah. So would it just be that the, the onus so is on you to put it in the mail within five days or that they, or does someone actually have to, you know, where does the onus stop, I guess, on this one? What if you don't have the, you have your address, you put it in the mail, so your, your job's done because you did that, but it's the what if they're not the there? The translation piece that would be a challenge, I think, for us to get done in that amount of time it would take to get it back and then have it mailed to, because we don't email that kind of information. So it, it, I, I would say, unless it was somebody in the house that could translate it, we would have, we would be able to meet the five days. Yeah. My take was it's going to be a hardship and it's a completely logical request. Mm -hmm. Well, that's it. makes it. perfect yeah. sense right. and it's, it's going to be a pain. It's not and always clear cut. I know. It's not. And it, I think under the explanation, what I mean, it's a lot to, to weigh out, but it, it did um, mention at the bottom that it, it might subject school districts to higher costs or litigation should they fail to comply. So I do worry about that litigation piece of if they don't have it translated and adequately given in the five days, then does that open the district up to litigation because it... It's five days before a meeting. Yep. Is that right. the language? Mm -hmm. so, so you just delay the meeting. Yeah, until, so, well, they can delay the meeting up to anyway. the 45-day mark. Yeah. They couldn't delay right. any farther than that. Right. They could get consent from the parent or something like that, but... For English-speaking so, family, I mean, so you formerly director of pupil services, so uh, how far in advance would um, English-speaking families receive assessments so prior they, to, prior I don't know what the IP. process is now, maybe someone else better than I, but um, prior they would have to ask for That's it if they were to receive it, and um, 48 hours in advance is the amount of time that we have by law to give it to parents. We try to get them earlier. We, we get them out as soon as we can, but we have been, so. I also, I, and I don't think anyone has the answer, but another yeah. thing, it seems to be written different ways before and after the explanation, it says that they will mail all of the assessments that are performed for the student. So is that before or after they take the assessment? Is it the score or is it an explanation of the assessment that's going to be taken? And then later it says require that information be provided. Well, which information? Any information? All information? You can't mail some it's a little. You can't even mail some protocols. You wouldn't even share right. that. So I don't know what this is. Right. So I think it's not. Do they know what the kids are taking? Do they understand? And here's the other thing you said. Right. Understand what they're reading? 
Yeah, I think it's. I, That's I think not necessarily I, I, happening. They might have it, but understanding it yeah. completely. I'm sure the spirit of it's it difficult. is to make sure families are understanding the right. information that they're receiving, so that they can go and make informed decisions. Right. Right. So that's the. That's, that's the why I said it that's was logical. It makes sense. Right. Yeah. I think that the timeline is pretty. It's strong. unfortunate because I think that it, the law as it it's written needs to be changed, but I don't think that this is this is necessarily the right way to do it. Right. But that's what it's saying. It's, we're urging the legislature to change. No, the law. I don't think this is the way oh, it needs this to wording. be written. Yeah. I gotcha. But it needs to be changed, but I I, I wish I wrote it for them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if it if it fails, we know that the Long Meadow School Committee can bring forth a resolution <laughs> next year and we'll have our our resolution here in the packets for 2019-2020. Um, so let's go ahead. Does anyone have any other comments or questions? We can call for a vote on that one. So I'll say all those in favor, all those opposed, any abstaining. Okay, so that resolution fails. So Diane, will you have a breakdown of, the, I know I took some notes as, the, as that yeah, was happening, but you'll have a yeah. clean, nice thing for me to take to the, sure meeting so that I have a, thank you, I wanted to make sure, that, I wanted to know how that works. Point of order on that one. Zero, three, four, would you abstain at right. the session? I'm sorry. That vote was zero, three, four. Would you abstain at the session? Or vote no. Oh, I would. I would abstain. Right, okay. Yeah. yeah. I would too, but I just wanted to clarify. Sure, yeah. Thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I would abstain. Yeah. Um, Thank you. So, yes, I will. I will take care of that as the delegate once we're at the uh, the conference. And if it doesn't pass, and they want a different one for next year, you feel free to volunteer my name. <laughs> oh, I will. <laughs> working, working, suffering. <laughs> um, it's the optic. You want to get it right. I mean, if just yeah, if we're not satisfied, um, you know, it's not. It's not to say that we we have to. Or we can be as satisfied a with these committee, resolutions. Whatever the committee has come up with their own resolution, like you wanted that change, and then present it and see if they'll put it through the MASC. Right, and hopefully next year we'll have the resolutions from <laughs> MASC. Right then and there, <laughs> <laughs> quicker. Um, so we do have an executive session planned for this meeting. If we can get a motion. I move the school committee meet an executive session pursuant to MGLC 30A. Chapter 21, a purpose A, to conduct a strategy session of preparation and collective bargaining with units A, B, C, D, E, F, and H, and purpose seven consideration and release of executive session minutes from previous meetings to not reconvene into open session. And this does require a roll call vote. Anyone have a second on that? Second. I'm Ray I. Ron and I, I. Melody Ronson, I. Beth Barron, I. Karen Moore, I. Stephanie Jasmine, I. Brian Kelly, I. So the meeting's adjourned. Yeah. Gotta be excused. <laughs> <laughs> Only if you.